Hey, everybody. Welcome to Sunday morning. Uh, our nine, well, our 901st episode. We're going to talk about 900 because 900 was really busy. You know, we had a huge crew all over the world um, that was working on covering IBC yesterday. And the gr part of the ground crew, I don't think the whole ground crew, but part of the ground crew is actually somewhere, somewhere in Amsterdam. Are you, are you still in Amsterdam, everybody? Can you hear us waving? Now, this is kind of an ad hoc last minute thing, so I don't know how well everybody's set up here. Can you guys talk a little bit? Can you hear us? Karen? Yeah, we can definitely. Hi, yeah. We're not, um, but we can't hear you very well, but we can definitely hear you. Hi, Alex. <laughs> Hi there. Hey, how was, how was the experience? Tiring. Tiring. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and where are you now? Uh, so we're, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're outside. We're in the, we're outside the RV. Um, coming Where's the RV though? Starlink. The RV, yeah, we're in Amsterdam in a in a campsite about ten minutes, fifteen minutes away from um, uh, from the IBC. Uh, so the so the uh, the RV is station. the RV is working well. Whoop! Can you hear me? Oh, the RV is working yes, well. It is. It is. It is. It's been a reconstructed and deconstructed. Two or three times. That's why I'm apologise for the this rather hacked together um, setup. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a. Uh, it's, it's been it's worked well. It's great. It's great. And and did do you have any stories that you wanted to tell about about the process? Uh, anything that happened? Uh, we do, but I think your show isn't a five hour show, so it might be there's been we all have multiple stories of it. But um yeah, it'll make a good second hour. Yeah, that's good. And so yeah, I think we're working on schedule in the second hour, both, you know, and how it got done and get some of your stories. So as soon as we have that done, we'll get it into the schedule. But looking forward to it. Cool. We have Thanks, to go. Sir. Thanks great everybody. job, guys. So, yeah, great, great job. job. <laughs> great, great work. Um, very, very good. So anyway, it's good to see all of you. I see it's good to see that you're all having a good time sitting out. Uh, yeah. What's the temperature like there? It's not too bad, actually. It's about, what, 22, 23? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. That's good. So uh, excellent. Well, continue to enjoy the uh, the, the, the the relaxation. Uh, are you all st are you still going to IBC for the next couple of days? Or are you done? Yeah, tomorrow's the last day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. All right. Well, enjoy, and um, and we'll uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right. See you guys. Bye. Right. Bye bye. All right. Uh, next question uh, from our uh, our first question for the for the morning is uh, from Paul Valhus. He said, "What is the optimum number of panelists for office hours? What is the minimum panelist requirement?" Go ahead, Mitchell. I I cannot tell a lie. I was uh, discussing that with uh, Dennis along with the panel here. I believe the maximum number we're able to do is 19 uh, because we need to leave room for audio, uh, for video playback. I believe that is true. Dennis said that, so it's got to be true on the back end. And as far as minimum, two, one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, your yeah, minimum would be very like two. Um, I think maximum right now is 19. We could probably easily go up now. We have to look at how many inputs we're using and what we're using them for related to... Uh, um, you know, I think that I don't think I would try anymore. I've gotten very comfortable with the numbers. So for those of you watching that, that haven't been here forever, the panel used to get very large. It was in the 30, 40 range. Oftentimes, this was during COVID. No one had anything else to do. Uh, things have gotten a little bit busier and we usually range between 10 and 15 is kind of the, 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 the general range, maybe 8 and 15. Um, I, th I find it, it really just depends on who's in the panel. Like there's not really a minimum number of p panelists. It is, uh, do we have most questions covered? You know, that's all that I think matters is uh, having enough people to, you know, give us flavor. And, and the goal is real expert input, you know, not not stuff that we're, you know, we, we sometimes try to do, just do the best we can. But the goal is that hey, if you're having an audio question, you have someone who's actually done it, you know, saying, well, this might be the, the thing. Um, and so, so it, you know, and we get such a wide range of questions. I think it's, it's mostly just it's, it's who's in the, in the panel less and less of how many. Having more definitely increases the chances of, of success as far as answering the questions. But it also can, um, you know, if panelists aren't careful about like really being to the point 
uh, it can get to be like there's eight people that want to answer a question and all of them take two minutes and you know that becomes problematic so so the larger ones i i i would say that if i was asked i'd say somewhere between 12 and 16 is a great great number and by the way that's an insane number like when you really think about it we used to people used to say oh i want to do a round table with seven people i'm like that is crazy like you're not no one you know like you should never do that and uh and so the fact that we routinely do more than 10 is pretty outrageous um but i think that and again i think that there's some i felt you know i think that when we get below that you just really have to have no, this person really knows IT, this person really knows audio, this, as it gets smaller, you really have to have real experts in there. It's one of the things that we're going to work on a lot as we go into the future is, you know, I'm working on it. I mean, we haven't figured it all out yet, but basically an invite system that is, you know, here's some people that are kind of core that come here often. Here are like Tuesdays, we might be sending out invitations for folks in audio, you know, like we'd love to have you on for these things. This is what the second hour, but start to organize it around you know, there's invites and if people say, no, I can't make it, it goes through and tries to find people that would be interested in that, in that process so that we can, um, try to, you know, solidify knowing that we have, have that all the bases covered for each one of these. And that's going to be something that is a puzzle that we haven't figured out yet. <laughs> so we just, we just keep it just open if you if people are interested. All right. Uh, next question is, oh, Mitchell, Mitchell you're going to say something else or did you already, did I already? No, I got it. Thanks. Sometimes on Sundays, you'll find that I, I talk a little bit too much and then I forget whether someone's been the last thing or not. Uh, next question is from Mark Giuliani from Washington, D.C. And uh, Mark asks, what has been your favorite moment in office hours or after hours? Go at Hosmuk. Well, it's a brio story, <clears throat> two, two parts to the brio story. One was when Alex realized that he could get brios from South Africa. And uh, <laughs> God, because... God. I need 20 I brios. Them. I need 20 brios and there was no brios. And, yeah. I, and, 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 and it was like, my, you got to get my boss was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I know I can get 20 out of South Africa. And he, he called, he called, he's like, how do we know this guy? And I'm like, I know him from, from, I know I've known him before even office hours. I've, I, you know, I'm sure he's good for it. And he's like, he called him my South Africa, the, the South African mafia is getting us, uh, getting us uh, brios. Anyway, go ahead, Cosmic. Yeah. Well, that little transaction got me to know Alex a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> under pressure <laughs> I mean three days on DHL was kind of close from yeah. Cape Town to San Francisco and of course we were afraid that one big package would get the attention of, yeah, of yeah. Uh, customs and so there are like five packages we'll to five different, them in five different felt like yeah. we were doing like a drug deal yeah, the only thing I got, I got all, all their telephone numbers and addresses in my little black book. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't distribute that. The other Brio story was uh, in a session, we suddenly realized that we could remotely control the Brio. And it was such great excitement because Alex took over the control of my Brio and the, the zooming and the uh focus so that was a bit of a revelation and everybody got very excited by that of course there are many many other moments that i could could talk about but personally those were the two big highlights for me go ahead Todd. um <clears throat> excuse me the uh my my, my long-term memory i guess is is shot so i'm gonna i'm going to uh kind of pick a moment from yesterday which is the hug Andy and Jonathan. Uh, last night, I happened to have dinner with my good friend, who is the theater director, who began to first work with Andy when he just began to start coding with Zoom and making all this theater possible for so many people around the United States before any of this, any of the Zoom ISO stuff happened, before Zoom OSC. And so we waxed poetically about Andy for a long time over dinner. That was what our dinner was about. And uh, so anyway, that, 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 that made that hug between uh, Andy and Jonathan, who I believe have known each other since kindergarten. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose yesterday and let it go at that. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I watching, uh, watching Andy go both on the hit that happened during the IBC. And then this, I was like, he is just the whole package. <laughs> like, he's just like, at the moment, the moment he came into office hours and, and started answering questions, I was like, this is. You can sometimes just see someone moving and it was just, you know, his ability to, 
uh, succinctly and powerfully talk about what he's working on, as well as um, his understanding of people, as well as understanding of program and process is, I mean, and I just keep on, I'm not going to get into his age, but he's, he's, he's a lot younger than I am. I'm he's kind of fierce. amazed. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to watch him. Uh, go ahead. We're going to, we're going to get to say that we used to hang out with Andy. <laughs> That's all I'm telling you. All right. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. I've only been here about a year. Um, I hear stories about the classic uh, Grant uh, story and uh, Andy Carluccio on the same was, time. And I, d I can't tell the story as well as one of you can because I wasn't there, but I just keep hearing it over and over again. It was just, it was so good because Andy has no ego and, and Grant has no ego. And so the, the fact that they were just like, you know, the and, and Grant, Grant was just excited. He didn't know Andy at all, didn't know who he was. And he was trying to show off o OSC because he was excited about it and he was showing it off in, in after hours. And, uh, and, and then Andy, um, we had shown up because we had talked about it. A bunch of people had all registered from office hours. So he was trying to figure out where, wh what is this? And so he just jumped into the off after hours to see what, who we were. Then he sees us immediately talking about OSC and he started giving Grant some, <laughs> Grant some tips on using his product. And, but Grant didn't know who he was. And he's like, Hey buddy, it's not my first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> it, was just, it was, and then suddenly at some point realized that he was talking to the developer. So it was, it was really good. It was, it was classic. Um, yeah. So anyway, Paul. I think for me, uh, um, I was trying to remember which was the first show I was on. I know it was early days. It wasn't the first, I know that much. But it was a few weeks after they started, you started. Um, but for me, the, the best one was um, when we had Graham Care on as a guest. And um, I put in a question asking to say hello to my mum. And he spoke directly to camera, to her. And I showed it to her afterwards. And she's quite emotional anyway. But imagine she burst into tears. That was wonderful. So that, <laughs> that stood out to me. That's great. Uh, Sky. Oh, that tickles me. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, hearing the phrase nutrient-rich environment has changed my world, Alex. So thank you for that. Uh, when Guy Cochran at 6 a.m. was called by JJ and said, oh, you got to get over and help Sky. And he shows up with an amazing amount of gear for the Madden Kitchen experience. And then when John Preto said, oh, this isn't about a space launch, a rocket launch. It's about community. Those are my kind of my seminal moments. And, and it's just been awesome. Thank you, Bill. So I'm going back to the day we were, I guess, three or four months in, and, and uh, it was Christmas time, and Alex brought his neighbor on, Elmo Shropshire, nicest man in the world. But uh, I think Alex had planned on getting everything set up, and then he was going to host the show for that. But for some reason, the technical issues didn't get solved in time. So at the very last minute, he pinged me <laughs> and went, can you host? I know. I, I just I realized... I went, Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, and I realized that um, uh, I realized that I couldn't do a great job with Elmo. Like I couldn't manage his and it's still COVID. So I couldn't bring a lot of people over. And it was so it was like one of those things that I, I couldn't suddenly I suddenly realized I can't be in two places at one time. Like I can't do both of these things and have it turn out to be a good show. And so I just threw the ball to Bill. He is like a receiver. that hadn't even turned around yet. <laughs> the ball, he just turned around the ball right there. You know, but, so. and here's the point I wanted to make. Alex tells you that he preps. He really does because he sent me like three pages of text that made all the difference for me. If he hadn't sent me that sheet that he had spent time, even though he knew this guy, he understood exactly how the show was supposed to go in his head. He had pre-prepared with something on paper. So when he sent that to me, I just remember the feeling like, oh my gosh, maybe I can do this, even though I'm completely out of any personal comfort. That settled me down. So I think the lesson that I took away from that uh, you know, I still messed up parts of the interview, but it, I was at least I had a guide. And so that prep work has always in, inspired me to be even ca more careful about documenting and doing the prep you can, because you never know at the last minute what's going to go wrong. And that throwing the ball means that that person who's going to catch it suddenly has to has to have some grounding in what's supposed to happen. Well, and I think that the the incredible thing, not so much as a single moment, but as something that keeps on happening is that I'm getting, you know, we're getting to a point where we're so resilient. Like if something happens and I can't be here, I'm not worried about it. And we're, and we're constantly now 
you know, bringing up, giving other people opportunities to host, giving other, you know, other people are taking over and every day I'm doing less, which is great. Um, and, you know, and the, and the community is taking over and it's not just one person. It's usually multiple people that are kind of making it all work. And, and it's, you know, it just becomes each day, it becomes less and less about me and more and more about the community. And, and, and that makes the community more and more resilient. You know, the places that are still bottleneck through me are problematic, <laughs> which we're still working on. Um, but, um, but I love, I love the fact that we keep on, that I can hand it off to somebody else and then it still will work, um, is, is exciting. Harshid. So where I'm going to take it is after hours, uh, we want to give a shout out to our Australian friends and the way that Zach sometimes communicates with us. And I remember the first day we just started talking and I translated for him as he was speaking. But it was just a funny thing. And then after the fact, he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Everybody does it anyway. So it was a conversation we had after. But to this day, how we've evolved, I think, to look at the patterns of office hours, uh, OH Space was a community-based driven project. But I had a little input, hey, uh, there's a logo missing because of accessibility in your website. Just a little bit of touch is all you need to join our community because it is part of us. We created it. And we make it look good and we make it look bad. So it's our choice, right? And so respecting each other and all of that, I think, is so incredible with uh, having the multitude of people from all around the world to hear maybe what do you have for Internet in your country? You know, just that little bit of conversation makes us move further. And I think the OH Space Project was one of my most memorable. And then after hours, we're just always collectively sharing ideas. You know, if I need help with cameras or lighting, it's so it's, you know seamless to just walk in and hey uh, I'm gonna go on show real quick am I framed do I sound good and you just move on so yeah, th those are great. my moments yeah, absolutely Courtney well my um, my favorite some of my favorite moments really didn't, never happened on on the air here but were uh, happened during the mic checks you know uh, before we were limited to our uh, descriptions of our channel, the creativity of all the panelists in coming up with phrases to check their microphones, and the ability to work our way through Paul Wallace's microphone collection was very informative <laughs> and very entertaining, and Paul was a good sport about it. And uh, we learned a lot there just in those mic checks about all the different microphones we could choose from. Go ahead, George. So I, after 900 plus shows, I don't think there's necessarily one favorite moment. I think for me is the general laughter. Doing, we don't take ourselves, we take ourselves seriously, but we don't, and there's always laughter. But I think uh, one of my favorite moments might, might have been this past week here, obviously the Andy Factor. And one of my favorite moments, and it might, it might not sound right, but it's just the work that was done at IBC. I think for a person that went to NAB for, for a number of years and did coverage, walked around with gear, the coverage cinematic. And I don't think, I think we, we, we tried to get to this point for the past couple of months, and I think we're there now. And it was just so impressive and, and, and you know, to see the coverage and the, the look of the cameras. I think that's, that was one of my favorite moments to see Office Hours to where it is and, and those feeds coming back. I was actually on a gig and I called the crew over, I said, hey, look, this is office hours, this is Zoom. And I was able to show them ISO. I said, this is coverage coming back over live view. So that was one of my favorite moments to be proud of you guys and show it to the crew and I show I was on, say, hey, this is what, what's being done with Zoom. That's great, yeah, Greg. Well, you know, I know a lot of people who are kind of suffering from PTSD from COVID. And the one thing that I really want to say about office hours is during that whole period when we were, you know, locked in our bunkers, we met every day. I mean, I, and I know you do this every day anyway, but for me, that was it was really, really something because it gave me purpose every single day. And I didn't have time to think about oh my god i can't do this because i'm i'm stuck at home i can't do this i can't do that this was this was it you know so and that was that was just fantastic but the other thing that i wanted to a favorite moment for me is when um is when we premiered our first song because we had you know we had decided to we had decided to make a band you know you you get into a group of people and and you know somebody always says oh let's make a band it, you know, and that kind of always comes up and it's like, yeah, you're right. But we actually did it. 
And, you know, we, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it. And when we, get, when we got the first one out, it was, that was pretty exciting for me. So. I'm I'm amazed by the band. Just as a, as an aside, it, it's just that that the it's not just that the band is getting together and throwing some tracks together like other people are doing on the internet. It's a it's a bunch of folks that really know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's so like technically know what they're doing, and they're putting together incredibly competent, um, you, know, you know, great mu musical songs, but also very competent songs in a way that, and when you break it down of having the arrangement done and the, and the individual records and the editing and the process, it's just, it's really amazing to, to, to see that and to see it continue. It's really, really quite a thing. Thank God, Leland. I knew with Greg ahead of me, the band was going to be mentioned because that's where I was going with it. My, my favorite moment on OH was actually when Grant and Victor got together to sing that Christmas song. It was when we first realized the enormous amount of talent that was in this group, that it wasn't just technical geeks. It wasn't just AV operators. It was a bunch of people with other passions that needed to be expressed during that period of COVID that we were in. So yeah. I, I definitely saw that that was one aspect of OH and that, that kind of kickstarted all the other little branches of OH that came after that. So I think it's, it was that moment in time that really made a big difference at OH. Good, Mark. The building of the Raspberry Pi, because I think it brought together a small group of people and they worked through all the different problems they had doing it over an extended period of time. So it was really fun to watch that just a group of people working together. Yeah. yeah go ahead, Tom. Well, I kind of wrap it up into one word called evolution. I watch NAM, Senegir, IBC, then I see OH10 to 20. I can't even imagine what 3.0 is going to be like. Mitchell? I just wanted to jump in on behalf of my friend, uh, Kenneth. We had a long talk last night on After Hours, and he was thrilled with the moment when uh, Andy Carluccio and Jonathan uh, uh, hugged each other, and they started announcing uh, what they were doing and, and their relationship, and they cut back to you. And the look on your face, as Kenneth uh, described it, was a proud papa. Uh, and he has a frame of it. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't do this sooner so you get a chance to see it, but I just wanted to say this on behalf of uh, Kenneth, who's working on the back end, that it was a special moment for him, and I agree. I think to seeing the look on your face, Alex, when this all came together uh, in that one moment, and uh, you were the proud papa without a doubt. I, I don't know if I'm a papa as far as a partner, but, 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 but I'm just excited. I, I'm just really excited about what... You know, I think that there has become a real symbiotic relationship between Zoom, you know, Liminal and, and what Office Hours is doing. And I think we both uh, benefit, you know, from from that relationship, you know, as far as learning and figuring things out. Um, I think that for me, you know, there's moments I was trying to think about it. It's not a single moment, but there are moments when I go, oh, this is bigger. You know, like this is like I see something that just kind of gets me excited and has me think about a bunch of things that we have to do around that that thing. Um, you know, for me, the. Uh, um, the Brian Band arc coming on. <laughs> I was a big fan of the Verve Pipe. So the idea that of, like the lead singer just came on and did an acoustic for us. Um, the Raspberry Pi, you know, I was like, oh, we're really on to something there. You know, that that was um, uh, that was that was kind of, you know, just something special. Um, these these conferences and watching this huge thing build up where there's tens of people and the um, uh, the you know, the bank, you know, obviously the remotes, you know, but I just see this thing like it's way bigger than any other online community that I've seen is because there's so many people creating. For me, the moment though, that when I, when I had to, I, I sometimes I just relax when someone asks a question like this and what pops into my head, like just like what, so it's not so much of a, a uh, thought out process, but there was a morning before, uh, one of our office hours, you know, at five thirty in the morning and Todd came on and said, what would you like me to play? And I have this, I, I really love this one violin piece called A Shokin Farewell. And I didn't know if Todd knew it or not, but I just blurted it out. Like, I'd want you to play it. And he played the most beautiful version of it, probably the best version I've ever heard <laughs> you know, of that, of that song. It had so much feeling. And I've listened to that song maybe a thousand times, you know? And, um, and so it was just like, and the fact that someone just randomly... <laughs> I mean, not randomly, but, but th that I was in a, in a moment where someone that I, I have, uh, you know, not really had not really known just was there and just was able to pick it up and play one of my favorite pieces of music better than I've ever heard it before 
in, in after hours was just like over the top, <laughs> you know, like over the top for me. Like I was just, I talked about that for like two weeks, you know, with people love just like, I can't believe what just happened in my, in my, you know, it was just, it was, you know, concert, I mean, above concert level, like above everything. Like it was just the most amazing rendition of that song. And of course we don't record back <laughs> in the after hours. And so it was also just a moment to remember, you know, like it was a, it was really special. Anyway, that was, that was the thing that popped into my head. So, um, Anyway, let's go to the next question. Uh, next question is from um, Mitchell Hill, uh, and he says, what were the standout product announcements at IBC? Go ahead, Mitch. Without a doubt, I think the one that hits the most home with us is uh, Zoom ISO version 2.0. It's just yeah. an amazing piece, and what it does, and the value that, uh, that it not only brings to the, the party, but the fact that it's one of our own. Uh, in a sense, because we have a, we all have a little piece of that, I guess, uh, Andy and Jonathan. So, congratulations. I think that it is. It truly is a product. I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of things that I thought were really interesting that was released at IBC. You know, there's a new Sony PTZ camera which was released a little before, but for IBC. There's the new Ultimats that are incredibly inexpensive. I mean, now suddenly we can do four cameras of uh, four digital set cameras. In for 2,500 bucks to key them is kind of amazing. It used to be um, 50 times more than that. Uh, the um, so the the new Ultimats are pretty interesting. Um, the new Teradek stuff, which we haven't talked about yet, is pretty interesting. But what I will say is that the thing that'll change the world, and, and a lot of it has to do with us, is the is the Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC. Um, you know that the Zoom ISO changes the way people do events. It changes the way people do broadcast. It changes the way. I mean it. Broadcasts will either catch up or people like us will run them over, but they don't get a choice anymore. Like, you know, like this is the, 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 the horses are out of the gate, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, and, you know, and, um, but the, we're, we will be producing broadcast quality shows in the next couple months, you know, um, we're very close right now. And, but, but we're going to spend a lot of time working on, on getting better and, and not just for a handful of us, but as many people as possible, because it's not about us, a handful of us having the information. It's about changing the way the industry works. And if we can change the way the industry works, it creates enormous um, opportunities for everyone in our community because they'll, we'll need more editors, we'll need more graphics, we'll need more sound, we'll need more everything if people start building real events. And, you know, Zoom OS, ISO, I mean, we're already running Zoom, this on Zoom ISO, but when we look at what you know, as we pioneer what's possible here in office hours with what with 2.0, this is why I'm, I was alluding to it before this, that we're going to pivot really hard because I don't want to waste any time. I mean, we're going to be able to do things that we were never able to do before. And, um, and we're going to pioneer that and push it and try to grow the largest group of people that are using these products in the world, because it makes a difference, you know, and it, you know, it really creates more opportunity for people anywhere to be part of the conversation. Go ahead, George. I think for me, if you grew up in the world of uh, Sony PD-150s and you owned one of those cameras back in the day and you see what was announced with this PTZ camera, and I don't want to piggyback on what Alex said, but it definitely, for, if you work in an environment where you're constantly using different camera sets and, and PTZ is part of that workflow, this camera is a very big deal because suddenly you could change the look of your background and everything else with this PTZ camera. So for those that's going to say right now, it's, it doesn't, it's not a relevant camera. It's more than relevant. A lot of us are going to rent it. A lot of us are going to own it. I'm ready to buy. Like I, I haven't even said we got to play it yet. I'm like, I haven't jumped out of the, I mean, I, I've, I've bought a lot of Sony cameras, but I've, I haven't been at using something other than black magic for the last, uh, you know, I don't know, eight years. And um, I am very in the market for this one because I think it changes a lot of the way we can, what, we, what it can look like. And again, at $10,000, you know, for the body, it means that almost, I mean, again, anyone in a professional world, that's a very small number for a camera that's shooting that kind of quality. And again, it puts broadcast on notice. Like we're about to pass, like you're, what we consider traditional TV is about to become the small screen, you know, in the next two years. It, it, you know, you're gonna see creators and everyone else using cameras like this, using things like Zoom ISO, and we're going to leave them behind, you know, and, and they'll lie, some, a handful of them will keep up in the same way magazines got left behind, you know, and other things, you know, it's not like, this is just the evolution of it, but you're about to see the pinch. You know, we always call it the pinch where it just goes, it goes, 
<laughs> you know, like and it's our, or the hockey stick, and some some people call it. But we're about to we're on the front end of the hockey stick, and it's about to go. Um, next question is oh, that's me. Next question. Mark Giuliani from Washington D.C. asks, um, "Congratulations on show 900. What would everyone like to see change over the next 900 shows <laughs> of, of office hours and after hours?" Go ahead, Mitchell. Kind of came together for me and a bunch of uh, uh, friends of uh, <clears throat> excuse me office hours on after hours last night. We went into the wee hours of the morning, and um, it was stated by Robert Shoji, who's a big fan of the program and uh, sometimes panelist. I think he's been in a couple of times, but he said that he he welcomed the opportunity for the program to expand with, I think we had like 30 or 40 participants last night, but he was worried initially that 500 or 1,000 or whatever uh, participants might take a little bit of the humanity away from what the program is. So it's sort of a cautionary note in the sense that Let's try to keep the humanity, the, the familial uh, tech uh, fans that we are, keep that sensibility no matter how big we get. We're going to get bigger, but hopefully he was hoping that it would do that because he really likes uh, what we do. And it's kind of, you know, it's one thing to know it as a participant in Office Hours. Another thing to hear it from somebody else from their perspective. And uh, Robert had said that he, he's been involved in a lot of other uh, forums and broadcast and nobody does it better. So thanks Robert. And uh, thanks, Robert. hopefully we'll be able to keep that. There you go. It's guy. I'm very excited about uh, Josh is doing all of the second hour management and consequently the participation in a creative experience. And I, I loved the, the Thursday morning music, the people that you brought in Alex. And because I didn't recognize that really speaks to my heart and it fulfills me. So consequently, uh, I don't know if in the show to put music, but, or it, if nothing else, that uh, bringing some, the how is the story created? Of course, you, you knew I was gonna say that. So the, the, the why of the how of, of the story. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I think um, going back to those early days and even before Office Hours, I think this is what Pixel Core was supposed to be, right, mm -hmm. Alex? So it, uh, I, I see it like that. It's part of it, you know. Like it, it you know, Pixelcore had uh, Pixelcore had more structure that we don't have yet here. Um, that that I think allowed it to do bigger things than what we are doing yet. <laughs> you know, so um, you know, so but but I think that we'll we'll keep on. I mean, I'm I took a very opposite of, of um, direction with office hours with Pixelcore. People just kind of came in, were given responsibility almost immediately, and just kind of you know, <laughs> learn while you're, fall, you know, learn how to use the parachute while, well, after we kicked you out of the plane, you know, and, um, it, you know, adrenaline is a great way to train people, but it also stressed a lot of people out. <laughs> it was, and it didn't always work. Sometimes you know, quite a few number of people hit the ground. And so the, um, uh, so it was a very harsh way to, to train people. And I very consciously with office hours went the other way, which is I'm going to build a big gel of people and then let people who want to do more emerge from it you know, creating kind of that nutrient rich environment and allowing people to come out of it as opposed to kind of forcing people, a small number of people to take responsibility. But when you think about the teams, like for instance, the very first thing we did um, with PixCore was cover rope battle bots. And, uh, but that was done with, you know, three days of planning and, but we had 30 people, show, you know, 30 people physically with cameras, teams out there shooting, uh, you know, shooting videos of BattleBots and it came out pretty well, actually. It didn't, wasn't live. It was all, and they used them. I mean, BattleBots was super excited about it. And, um, and so, uh, and at, at our height, we had about over 250 people in very structured teams, you know, that were, that were um, kind of building up. And, um, and so, so I think that uh, there'll be more of the things that we learned from PixelCore you know, added in over time. Um, some of the stuff is already here, but we could never do this back to, to your point, Paul, we couldn't, you know, video was expensive. Like we were distributing things on Hotwire, if anyone remembers Hotwire, it was like a beat, a peer to peer, you know, thing, but we were distributing content and we had, I mean, it was all very uh, bootstrapped, you know, to make that work. Um, but yeah, we learned, we did learn a lot. It's a good time. <laughs> anyway, uh, I still run into people that, that come out of nowhere that, that are in Pixel Core, that were in Pixel Core. That, um, anyway, the, as far as office hours, I think that we will see more teams, more structure. I, 
900 shows from now, I do hope that we have at least a couple 24 seven, um, uh, channels, at least one, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that it's pretty widely, I, I know that I sound crazy when I'm obsessed with getting satellite distribution, but I just know that there's a lot of people who are in parts of the world that can't get the enough internet to watch our show and they still have access to radio and video and they may not have access to computers yet, but a lot of times it's being around the conversation, you know, like it doesn't mean that you, a lot of people who become great musicians or great, um, uh, you know, great sports figures grew up in families that did that, not because they started playing immediately, but they could hear the conversation. They could hear what was important. They could see those things. And so the idea is, is that, you know, we want people, even if they don't have access, the people who are interested and inspired by what we talk about are listening to it while they're, you know, herding cattle in, in Kenya. <laughs> you know, like in, and they're imagining when they can be part of that. And maybe they send, you know, and maybe we eventually we have places for them to go in Kenya for them to do that or Rwanda or Zimbabwe or, you know, Cambodia and Seam Reap. And I would love to have like a little space in Seam Reap, by the way. Um, but I'd, I'd only go in the winter. <laughs> the rainy season, it's, it gets really hot. So anyway, um, but but all over the world that there's like places where people can go and so on and so forth. And so so the, the satellite is just a banner of getting out to, you know, literally ha half or two thirds of the world um, uh, to, you know, to, 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 it's kind of the, the early, you know, way for them to start getting into it. So when they get here, they they already understand our culture. They are uh, all already understand those other pieces. Anyway, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. And, you know, a lot of teams, a lot of coverage. I think that what we're seeing with IBC, the amount of planning will, you know, become, will come in faster because we'll know more about it. Uh, it'll be more regimented. And I think we'll end up doing a show every, you know, every month or two like IBC you know, and, and we'll be doing lots and lots and lots of coverage. Um, and so, uh, but that's down, you know, down the road as we, as we slowly figure it out, we're getting to the point where we know we can do it. Now the point is the next step is to make it. So we've, we've gotten to the point where all the pieces are there, you know, NAB was, you know, still someone pretty high up, <laughs> you know, a couple people pretty high up in, in some of these companies said this, the NAB coverage was the best coverage they saw that year of NAB. Um, and that was when we were, that was our first try. And then I thought NAM and, and Cinegear got a lot better. I think that IBC is a lot better. And I think we're past the, like all the pieces are working. We can talk to the folks that are there. We can get the questions in, we can get it. Now the, the key is to tighten it to where it really feels like a, like a true, like seamless broadcast. Um, that's the next couple of these. And then, then it's to systematize it, you know, and so it's, you know, like we now know how to do this and now we can do it all the time. And it's something that a lot of people, and we train, you know, and then after that it's to train everybody to do them. Cause I think that this is, again, I think it's something that we could provide, not we as office hours, but people within office hours, as we systematize it, it is something that they could provide as a, as a service for conferences, I used to do that. So that's the reason I pay a lot of attention to these. I mean, one of the things I used to do is provide teams for conferences to just cover all the, you know, all the sponsor booths is what really what we did. If you sponsored the conference, you know, we would do some coverage of your thing. So we did a lot of these. Um, next question is from Grant Whitehead in Adelaide, Australia. Such a great week to celebrate the 900th, lots of Apple announcement chat, culminating in over 100 of us watching together. Then our minds blown with epic IBC coverage. What have your highlights been from this week? Go ahead, Sky. That Grant was there, that Ken was there, that Richard, that Emma, and of course, JJ in the background, I'm sure held something together because that's what JJ does. And then Mickey, of course, continued to participate and Josh organized and coordinated. And again, the hundreds of other names that put hundreds of not, if not thousands of hours into these experiences. I think that's the mind blowing thing because we talk about the, wouldn't it be nice ifs, but George, I think you really pointed it out. And then Paul kind of solidified my thought about the history of wouldn't it be nice ifs are now becoming the everyday, of course they're going to. And consequently, I, I think Todd mentioned it. I, I don't want to lose the, the uh, this is an amazing experience. And Alex, you talk about this shouldn't be able to happen, but it is happening. So it, that's my mind blowing thing of this is happening. This is a thing. Anytime someone says, wouldn't it be nice? All I can think of is Nick Kershaw with, wouldn't it be good? <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Hospik. Yeah, for me, IBC was a big highlight this week. I mean, I learned a lot. 
uh, I have this filthy habit of reading every post on Discord. And so I was following all the channels in the IBC channels, you know, the graphics and the all of them. And it was amazing to me the amount of work that went into it, the amount of coordination that went into it. But then to, and I didn't participate in any of the pre-work, but to see it all come together and being uh, uh, sitting in the after hours and listening to it on YouTube and you see the production really take life and the amount of coordination that went through, especially with Mickey and everybody made a superb effort. But uh, I mean, the way Mickey went about going through each of the groups and what I learned the most is planning, planning, planning and the amount of detail, attention that goes through it. So I think that's probably been a highlight for me. IB, IBC taught me a lot, not in terms of uh, undertaking a big production, but just even a small show, how much of pre-planning and how much attention to detail we need to apply to produce quality show. So every time somebody comes into my office and they look at all my equipment, they just get blown away. But then they look at me incredulously. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you really equipped to do this for us? And then I always bring them to office hours and I show them office hours global. And I go through some of the, uh, the shows that we have. And it's amazing how much of credibility that passes on to me just being part of office hours. Yeah. I got time. Of course, IBC, of course, watching the Apple announcement with all you folks is just always, it's just, it's so much fun watching something like that along with friends. It's all great. But actually, because Grant asked this question, I have to say that the other day, I don't get to talk with Grant all that much, but logged on to After Hours and there sat Grant and we talked and we had the loveliest conversation. And the thing about that conversation, that Grant doesn't know is that it inspired the rest of my day. And I felt something in that connection in that conversation, which took me the whole rest of the day and kind of gave me a, a greater sense of purpose. So you never know. You just never know in after hours what's going to happen, who you're going to see, what you're going to chat about. And, uh, and it can sometimes be super meaningful and kind of uh, in a way that you don't that you're not looking for. It's fine, George. Because of office hours and being a member of it, I know this, but we always talk about branding. I think the ability to morph from office hours daily, the look of office hours daily to IBC, but I still knew it was office hours, but the ability, I think you, you guys are doing a, a bang up job of, differentiating, hey, we're at IBC, but we're still office hours, but today we're office hours here. The look and feel of it was still the same, and I think it was flawless, flawlessly done. Good, Josh. I think um, just because we had the confluence of events that all happened on a week really kind of shows where we're at and where we're going. Um, you know, this 900 show and we have this IBC coverage that's been in the works and planning for a while. And one of our highest viewed uh, uh, events along the way, uh, it really shows that uh, like when we went from 1.0 to 2.0 and we kind of limp through it and now it's something we just do on a regular basis. I think it really shows the cadence we're moving at and it's something where a lot of large events that um, look intimidating now, it will be a matter of course, so just, just another Tuesday. I mean, I, I do think that we're going to get to a point where, you know, for some of these events, uh, I think, you know, because I think IBC was kind of an amazing thing. And I think that we're going to get to a point where there's 30. I, I know that I'll sound crazy right now, but two years from now, I think that you'll end up with 20 or 30 people descending on a location, you know, for it to cover it and uh, another, you know, 100 people on the, you know, online that are organized and building out graphics and coverage and everything else. And I think that, you know, it'll be, you know, again, it's the interesting thing about it is, is that where I'm hoping to go with the event coverage is that it's a service. I mean, it's, it's something that we do, but it's a service to the rest of the community, the community that can't go to the event. Like that's what I'm really focused on is how do we get to a point where 
the folks that can't go to IBC really experience IBC, really experience NAB and CES. Um, and, and that's the opportunity is to serve that. I don't, the rest of the other people that watch it is fine, but it's really taking care of the folks that, that can't be part of it that are in Africa or in Asia or in other parts of Europe and can't afford to, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. How do, how do they get that information? Because a lot of times in other parts of the world, you know, people fall behind because they just don't have that, they don't have access to the real time information um, that, that, uh, and be able to ask questions. I'm like, it's kind of amazing thing, you know, and I, I really, we'll see what is possible. We're going to try to extend NAB New York if we can, if I can get a couple things handled this week, we will try to extend the amount of time we cover NAB to at least a day, you know, and it may be longer than that. We'll see, we'll see what's possible. It depends on what, what we can get, but it is to really cover it and really have discussions and so on and so forth with the folks that we have access to there. Um, next question is uh, from George Kennedy and, uh, in Washington, D.C., and he says, what camera was used for the IBC coverage? Go ahead, George. As you can see in, in probably in the notes, it was um, the Ursa G2. I think if you know, you know the, the original, one of the original Ursas, the Bigums. Um, I walked around the floor at NAB with that thing in, in Vegas and uh, almost died. So uh, kudos to Ken that uh, using a, a 12K to cover IBC looked really good. <laughs> That's great. It did, it did look really good. Uh, next question is from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris asks, um, what is Alex's opinion of the last travel mic, the T-Bone? Um, I think I have one here. Hold on. Uh, this is the T-Bone. This was, uh, Carl had uh, recommended it. Uh, it is, you have to go back and look at it. I, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Um, the, I wanted the USB, what I've been testing is mics that have USB so that I can use them as a USB solution. Um, this isn't it. <laughs> so it's, it, the, the USB is not uh, loud enough, you know, so it, I mean, it just doesn't have enough gain to it to, to pull it off, um, which is unfortunate. But as a travel mic that isn't super expensive, still a little bulky, but isn't, I think it was a huge jump up from the headset that I was wearing. I mean, headsets just always, no matter how good they are, they're at a disadvantage. Um, I might send this one out if I was sending out, um, you know, some, something that had a preamp in it. But using the USB version of, of this, um, I think that the XLR sounded fine, but the USB version uh, may not work. Otherwise, though, I think it sounded pretty good. Uh, at least it sounded good to me, <laughs> you know, and of course I'm in a hotel with a fan, you know, like there was a bunch of other, you know, things going on in that hotel that, um, uh, it had a lot of bandwidth though. <laughs> so, um, but a very uncomfortable, um, yeah, as a whole, I have a whole lot of opinions about how hotels should organize themselves now, now that a lot of us need to be on remote, whether it's meetings or everything else, I think hotels need to organize themselves around, um, road warriors need to need, need to be on you know in meetings from their hotel room and they're not organized that way now right, go ahead mitchell why don't we uh have somebody build a microphone called the howard johnson's or the ritz carlton yeah there you go just exactly. just for traveling that would be yeah, exactly. funny it'd be good i have to rethink my whole i had a bunch of problems with the last one so we'll, we'll see i gotta rethink my whole um setup so i'm gonna be working on that because i have to go to it looks like i have to go back and i still owe courtney a cable Still be on a Motel coffee. 6 mic budget. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, our question is from Tom H. Chance in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, Tom asks, um, could we please get more cooking with Demyanti? I really miss uh, the knowledge and joy she brings. Um, uh, Dara uh, Jira is my favorite new pal in the kitchen, and I'm so much healthier after cooking through her book. Go ahead, Hasmuk. Well, the cooking show really meant a lot for me because it's the first thing that Damianti and I could work together as a team. So I was looking for a reason to work with her for the last uh, 40 odd years. So this, this cooking show did do that. We were hoping to do the sort of a cook along in after hours. I think I discussed that with Alex and uh, unfortunately COVID hit both of us and then uh, she had a 70th birthday so we kind of put it on hold <laughs> but this morning in fact I chatted to her I said let's do the cooking again and she said oh really why do we have to do that well <laughs> it's it's the only thing that brings us together and I got to sell a lot of books <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, no we 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 
we were th- we we talking about it. So uh, I mean, we do it for fun and we do it for passion, and for her, it's really to share knowledge. So we're thinking of doing things like a walk around the garden, look at all the herbs that she grows, explain the meaning of those herbs. So it's more kind of educational around healthy eating rather than following a recipe only. And uh, we're already planning our trip next year, a road trip to the U.S. I'm warning all of you, all my office hours friends, I'm going to squat at your facility, uh, Sky, in Seattle, and then we'll do a cooking show from each location. So Sounds great. you be, better, better mark your calendars. Sounds great. Sounds Love great. That. Yeah. We are definitely going to go back into some more cooking. I think that um, I'm working on very much b- between what I do for my day job as well as what we're doing in office hours, trying to reorganize a lot of things. And a lot of people are taking on more roles. Josh is taking on the second hours, which is a opens up a lot of time for me. Um, and uh, and um, but uh, there's so many people working on after hours. You know, um, um, you know, Brandon took over after hours, and so it's starting to starting to you know kind of go down that path and and everybody else that's taking over tons and tons of parts of it. And soon I won't even be starting the meeting. <laughs> I'll just be showing up. And, um, and so, uh, so there's a lot, a lot of those things as I reorganize all of the things that both within office hours, and it's not I, when I say I, when things are being taken away from me by the community, because <laughs> everyone kind of grabs onto it like, Hey, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so I'm not really, I'm not really doing it as much as everyone else is taking over, which is great. Um, the, uh, uh, as that gets reorganized and as I reorganize my, my work life as well, um, which I'm kind of in the middle of right now, um, I think I'll have more time to do things, more things like cooking and just more after hour stuff in general. So I'm, I'm uh, it's probably gonna take the rest of the year for me to, to get the reorganization completely finished, but I'm excited to do more of those kinds of things. This is the thing that I love to do. <laughs> like the other stuff pays bills. So, um, so anyway, uh, next question is, uh, from Fred. Eric Eckert in Bad Hernab, Germany. And Eric, Fred asks, uh, he's, he gave us a link to Casablanca.ai and he says, AI will soon be able to create eye contact without the need of a teleprompter. Could the panel please discuss pros and cons? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, as long as they build in eye blinks, uh, it, I think you can become looking too much like a zombie. Uh, Microsoft already has this, I think, in Teams. <clears throat> they have had it for a while, AI, that will correct your gaze replace your eyeballs with ones that are looking into the camera, even if you're not, even if the camera is off at an, uh, slightly at an angle and you're looking down at your screen. Uh, uh, they've had it uh, since earlier this year, I think, available. Um, but yeah, it, it tends to, I think it, it might tend to make you look a little bit zombified. So I don't welcome our zombie overlords. <laughs> Go ahead, Leland. It's obvious the purpose they're using AI is to alleviate that thing that we do with our ego and let's look at ourselves while we're on video. There are a couple other items that are out there that maybe people haven't seen yet, which are a hanging camera that's on a small wire that actually sticks to the monitor itself with a little suction cup about eye level and then that's your webcam. And there's others now that are creating conference cams like Alex is bringing out right now, I see, with a tower on it so that instead of having a bouncing webcam on your monitor, you have a unit on the base that either, oh, you bought that one, good, awesome. This is the one I was talking about. Much similar to that. So rather than AI replacement, try to consider a, a different placement for your camera. Uh, Mark? Well, m- maybe I don't understand this, but it seems to me that the advantage of the teleprompter is that you get, you still get to see the audience. You get to see who it is you're talking to. And so much of the communication is nonverbal that I think you might lose that when you go to this automatic eye tracking. Well, you'd be able to look at people and then it would theoretically reproduce it. But yeah, to, to Courtney's point that if it doesn't do it perfectly, it doesn't do it, it shouldn't do it at all. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, sorry, Josh. Anybody hear me, Josh? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think um, things seem to be like a good ideas, but they're replacing the need for 
things that you do normally. Like we have virtual and blurry backgrounds because instead of cleaning up your background or putting effort into, into it, people just like push a button and go, there you go, fixed. And I don't think some of those things necessarily replace uh, the need for it. And I think there's a natural thing. Like sometimes when you're, you're reading on something, it's natural to look down at something and read it. Whereas if, you know, even having the teleprompter idea, reading it right into it and not, you know, losing your gaze, there's a certain natural thing to this. So I, th I think it's one of those things where like, instead of doing it correctly or putting in the effort to make the eye contact, I don't think the digital is going to replace that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitch Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with Josh 100%. I think that this is a step in the wrong direction. Uh, if we're going to start wearing an avatar, it starts with the eyes, it goes to the rest of your body. Um, we're we're going to lose some essential humanness of our ability to communicate. And there's so much um, uh, sub whatever you want to call it that's going on in your communication and your body language and your eyes and your facial expressions and your voice. And I already hate those animated uh, uh, avatars that people wear. It makes me feel hinky. Yeah, I mean, I the thing that I always go back to is, you know, if you think about, and I'm going to do a horrible, horrible version of this, but you think about the lower brain and the upper brain, a lot of these things solve what the frontal lobe thinks it needs, right? So the eye contact by creating something new or the, you know, a lot of times social media and everything else, this we're creating community and everything else. But our reptilian brain still needs certain things. <laughs> it needs connection. It needs things that are authentic. Um, it needs thing. It need this. This part here still needs to be served, um, because the distance between this experience and this experience, the distance between these two is called depression. And that is the problem with social media. It's when our frontal lobe is telling us we're getting something, and our lower our 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 reptilian brain is saying I'm not being fulfilled. We get depressed, you know, and and um, and so that is. We need to always take that into account. So as we move away, as we have virtu virtual, you know, people and virtual backgrounds and virtual, all these other things, it creates, it creates that it just pushes those two apart. And we want to keep pulling them together, in my opinion. And so better audio, better video, better, more authentic, you know, communication are things that I think is part of why this community works is because we, we do things that are very basic that connect us as opposed to, um, you know, doing things with each other. You know, those kinds of things, those fulfill the reptilian brain, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and so uh, that lower brain is because it needs to be, you, you, we think that it, oh, that's some, something historic, but it, it is the thing that is a kind of a source of our feelings and our connection and our, you know, our impetus. So uh, next question is um, from uh, Keenan Campbell in Nevada, USA, not not Nevada. Oh, Nevada. Yeah. But somewhere in Nevada, we don't know exactly where. Um, he said, what's the plan? <laughs> John's house? <laughs> what's the plan for the thousandth show? Go ahead, Mitchell. A cake with 1000 candles in it, but how to light those candles. And I think, uh, Alex, you mentioned you've had great success with a novel way to do that. Flamethrower. 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 Yeah, a, exactly. a virtual or, or whatever flamethrower. I'm, I'm Make actually it a creme brulee cake and you've got a both things taken care of in one, one fell swoop. I actually think that we do have to do a thousand candles. And I have some ideas on how to do that, like relatively quickly. But it's going to take some construction. It's all going to, there's some welding involved. Does it um, involve pyro? It, it doesn't involve pyro, but it does involve a large flame setup. I think it's gonna. I have an idea of building a grid of, of uh, copper pipe with holes in them and pushing propane into it and lighting it up, and then dropping it down on the candles and pulling it back up again. So that's the, that's my current. I've been I've been pondering it on walks. Um, go ahead, Sky. Well, I since we're talking silly ideas, I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw in. I think we should all fly into Las Vegas and we will all meet at John's house. What do you think, John? <laughs> okay. Johnson. Thanks, John. Johnson. Everyone's got to bring a camper. Uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Last one in the pool is a rotten egg. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? I thought maybe Alex could do it today for our 900th <clears throat> is use some, one of those AI art generators and describe a birthday cake with 900 candles on it and uh, <clears throat> see what it comes up with and maybe the office hours logo or something or her office hours has an inscription on it. <clears throat> would be handy. And I don't know why we don't have that here as our mobile. 
Okay, I'm working on it. We'll see. We'll see if we get something by the end of the show. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Todd. Piggybacking on the idea of visiting Preto's house, um, Alex, have you ever skydived? I won't. <laughs> so, so I won't skydive. I'm not going to jump out of a okay. perfectly good airplane. Because because I, I was just I was just thinking how wonderful it would be to throw you out of a plane with a with a GoPro yeah, and, and, exactly. and and have you land at Preto's house. I think that that would be I, worth a thousandth show. I, for sure. I, I'm tempted, but it, the, my issue is, is that I have a thing like I don't really care when I die as long as I'm doing something useful while I'm, while it's happening or it, that it just the way it happened. <laughs> I just don't want to do I, I have this thing because I do a lot of crate. I've you know, I've worked in war zones and I've worked in, you know, I've done a lot of some pr pretty crazy things in my, in my life. And, and I just don't want to die doing something stupid. <laughs> like, I just don't want to be like, he was doing so well. And then he jumped out of a plane and hit the ground, you know, like, you know, and, and, uh, and the, think about all the other things he could have gotten done. So, so that's, so doing the, the, like that. So I, I did, and, and where I became very, I jumped, I did a bungee jump when I was like in my early twenties. And the moment I jumped off, to do the bungee jump from a hot air balloon or whatever. I was like, this is, if I die doing this, this is gonna, I'm going to feel really stupid. <laughs> you know, like, so, um, so anyway, I, I, that's, that was the end of my, it, I, I, my, the end of my adrenaline adventures was that one, that one jump. Cause I had been getting, I had been ratcheting up one after the other and think doing things crazier and crazier. And I did that. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. Like I, I don't need to do this, <laughs> but yeah, otherwise that would be kind of cool. If anyone else wants to do it, I'm not, I don't hold it against people. I think that skydiving is really cool. I just, I'm just afraid. We could double up, at Alex, get the two of us to go out at the same yeah, time. Exactly. Go ahead, Paul. I was just going to mention they did it with the queen with a bit of camera trickery. I'm sure we could do the same. We could do that. I'm happy to do the camera trickery. We can hire a stunt person to, to jump out and, and have that have that all work out. He turned out, though, to be... I, I, we have to pick better than the Queen. I think he turned out to be trouble. Um, anyway... John, uh, next, John Preto could make that work. Like, exactly. He could just stand in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next question is uh, from uh, uh, Colin McCulkey. Macaulay? Sorry, Macaulay. Okay, he... Uh, Mulcahy. There's a place you can put your pronunciation, so I know I know how to say it. McCall, Colin Mulcahy in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and uh, he says, "When when days uh, when when do you have in depth discussions around Zoom ISO infrastructure?" So every day between one and three, we're, we've kind of opened it up as a Zoom ISO lab, um, and so that's every day. Um, seven days a week, you can go in from one to three, we've been kind of careful of we don't want the whole recording, you know, popping up all day, as people want to figure it out. So it's one to three Pacific Standard Time. Um, the so we want to make sure that we um, keep it in that time frame right now. But we will in the mornings, um, I gotta we gotta get through I, IBC, but not probably not next week, but the week after, we will start to do more focused Zoom ISO discussions, walking through the interface, talking about how it works, looking at the options, you know, we're going to be pushing really hard on it in office hours. And so, so all of those things will be happening at the same time, um, as we kind of, as we kind of work through that. So, so anyway, that's the, um, um, that's our plan for, for that. And you'll see more and more discussions about it and more and more labs about it. Um, we really want people to, th the big thing is, is that there's a real power in a lot of us learning how to do it all at one time because we'll start bouncing off of each other and it'll get to the point where there's no question that you can't ask about zoom ISO that we, that someone in our group doesn't know the answer. And so we want to get to that, that as fast as possible. So there's going to be a real focus. It doesn't mean that everybody who is ever going to learn zoom ISO is going to do it in the first three weeks, but in the next three, four weeks, we're going to spend a lot of time, you know, by November one, we want to be, have a very, very, uh, sizable and knowledgeable group of people that know how to use this product and know how to take advantage of the product. And then we're going to keep on working on how do we apply it to events? How do we apply it to, to, um, and what, what else do we need? You know, we have a very, again, symbiotic relationship with Liminal uh, and Zoom. We, you know, we want to be the group that is, you know, I want to be the most important group in their, <laughs> in their, in their, in their, uh, list so that when we as a group say we really need these things, those things are made priority, you know, and, and then it allows us to kind of evolve the, the platform in a way that we need to be involved. And we have that relationship with a couple different companies. <laughs> so, uh, and we want to keep on growing those. And so for the companies that we work with closely, 
we definitely want to um, build up that because it, it gives us more uh, market leverage, you know, as well. And it's been a lot easier. And, and I think that in return, we can help, oh, you know, ISO, you know, really grow into all the different markets that, that we work in. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, very much interested with ISO and in revolution, <laughs> you know, like, rev, you know, really changing who gets to have conversations, you know, and, and really making it much wider. And so, you know, we're the sharp end of the stick. Uh, next, next question is also from Colin in Dublin, Ireland. He says, updating the workflow at studio, at the studio, looking at replacing ATEM key with Ultimat 12 units for each camera. Uh, we are already, we already have a UHD infrastructure uh, with black magic. Would there be any difference between using the HD or 4k models of the 1080p zoom ice for 1080p zoom ISO shows? And the answer is yes. So the keyers are 422. So that means that there's half the resolution of color. So the when you think about four, you know, that when you see 422, two, that means essentially, I'm going to simplify this a lot, but Y U Y U V is for every four pixels of of uh, Y, there's only two pixels of, of the color channels. And so that means that along these along edges and along hair, you're going to see aliasing because you took something that was half resolution and and just opened it up a little bit. And so you're not going to get the same level of um, same quality of key from a 422 as you would from a 444. So like the, one of the cameras that I have is a 444 camera. And most people have kind of given up making them because they're pretty specialty cameras. And so there's not a lot of cameras that do 444 anymore. Um, but these are 444 cameras. It's harder to do with a CMOS sensor. Anyway, what you can do though is oversample. So if you key something at 4K and then go down to 2K, down to 1080p, you're now gonna get essentially the same effect or very, very close to the same effect as a 444 pixel. So you wanna pull that key at that at a double the resolution of what you need. So if you already have a UHD, and I wouldn't say that everybody should do this, but if you already have a UHD unit uh, uh, infrastructure, I would key at 4K and then bring it down to um, 1080p for the zoom ISO shows. What I will say also is I've used the previous Ultimat here, which is this one's supposed to have better color science and better keying and everything else. It is head and shoulders over the advanced keyer in the switcher. Like it is not, they're not, they took some of the technology from that, but kind of a light version of that technology. It is incredible. I mean, you can key water in glass on a semi-transparent piece of plastic and get every little detail out of it. It's quite a thing. So it's a really powerful, the 1080p is most people will never notice the difference between the 1080p and the 4k. I notice it because the first thing I do when someone does a green screen key is look at all the hair and the edges, you know, that's, that's all I look at. So, so it is a, uh, I would definitely do that. The thing that I would recommend looking at, and I'm just waiting to hear back from black magic on a question that I asked them, which is, I'm not clear whether the, I think, that the 8K version is four independent UHD keyers, complete with new inputs, new stills, everything else. That means for that for $7,000, and you don't have to buy the hardware anymore on the front end, you're getting four, four UHD keyers. And four is a great number for a virtual set. <laughs> so, and so now, now what you could do there is take an alter, take a Unreal Engine background for each one of those. And if you're able to get the telemetry from the cameras, as you move the cameras, the Unreal Engine is moving, going into the Ultimate and being keyed, you know, by it. And so that even with moving shots and definitely with reframing, you'd be able to get a really great uh, virtual set, you know, out of it, I think. But we're waiting to get more information. We'll try to borrow one and test it because we have a big green screen to test it with. So we'll uh, we'll see what we can do there. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you've seen that 8K, it's got, so many gazentas and gazatas, it sure sounds like it's going to do what you want it to do. Yeah, I, I, I just can't wait to see an 8K ca ca camera. You know, like like Black Magic doesn't have a camera to supply all these 8K. They got 8K HyperDeck, 8K Switcher, 8K. They're slowly putting all these 8K things in. We're just not getting an actual camera to to supply the content. It's kind of crazy. Uh, next question is from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Uh, seems a bit like IzzyCast is going to provide a lot of flexibility that OH could take advantage of. Does a function, does it function standalone or is it an add-on to Zoom ISO? It's a standalone solution. 
Um, Zoom ISO kind of packages all of that up together, but I think that IzzyCast could probably do almost what what uh, Zoom ISO does. It's just in a different format. Um, I'm not sure if all the features are there, but you'd it, be close. But it's going to be really interesting. You know, I mean, I think that there's going to be a, a lot of things that, again, IzzyCast is another thing that we plan to get really good at as a group. Um, you know, L has already been able to, you know, come in, been kind enough to come in every week to help some of us work on that. But we definitely want to put some more focus into that. It's really interesting. I, I'm curious to see how we might use a lot of these um you know, the being able to do the sends and, you know, how we send video back and forth, audio back and forth, but mostly data back and forth. Um, you know, I, there's a future somewhere that most of the regular panelists are all have fairly similar systems and we supply them with DMX capable lighting and we're able to control everybody's lighting at every, at everybody in the panel, <laughs> control all their lighting, uh, cameras, everything from a remote system. And this is the first step into that. I mean, that's again, when we talk about the next 900, somewhere in the, between 800 and 1,000, or between 1,800 and 2,000, that would be the goal. So uh, still a long way away. Um, but the idea is that we really have full control over every endpoint. And I think that, and especially when you also think about digital events, imagine doing, uh, you know, we talk a lot, we're talking to a lot of clients about it. And I think that their head is starting to come around the idea of the digital first events, because they're realizing that, you know, hybrid kind of stinks. And, um, and they're trying to figure out what, okay, well, if, if we can't do hybrid, and especially for event companies, they're trying to stay relevant. How, what do we do? Well, like, how do we do it? And our argument is, well, just build up multiple endpoints. So you have, you know, you might have 300 people in San Francisco, but you have 100 people in New York, and you have 50 people in, in Cape Town, and you have, you know, you know, 20 people in Adelaide, and you have 100 in Tokyo, and whatever those things are, and everybody is a first you know, really feels like they're part of the event. And part of that would be if all those endpoints could not only get all the video that's that's going out to those endpoints, but all the lighting commands and all the sound effects and all the other things. And so if you're in Cape Town with 50 or 100 people, when all the lights go down for the show, all the lights go down for your show, <laughs> you know, like, and when, you know, and, and, and so, and from one central place, we're running the event in six or eight different locations around the world at the same time where they're really getting the full experience. Um, and the thing is, is that people keep on thinking that people are going to come back to conferences, but, um, you know, the next step, the next shoe to drop after COVID clears is going to be carbon, carbon impact. Like it is. Everyone was talking about it two years ago that as soon as things slow down with with COVID, they're going to start asking people to talk about their their climate impact of their shows. And that's going to put a huge downward pressure on, on big conferences because they're just going to be untenable. Like the big conferences are going to be anything over 5,000 people will be untenable from a PR perspective. Um, and so um, because it just, you know, we don't need to do that anymore. So it's going to be, um, and so I think that, you know, figuring these things out, and I think IzzyCast and what comes from IzzyCast is going to be a key component to that process. Um, next question is from Jeff Cohen in uh, Miami Beach, Florida. And uh, Jeff asks, uh, YouTube uh, live feed, I noticed I was able to rewind, uh, fast forward, the OHIBC stream, but I was not able to rewind the last Apple event live stream to YouTube. Any idea why? Is there something set by the streamer? Go ahead, Bill. And I'm not an expert in this. In fact, I use YouTube very seldom, but I was surprised in uh, recording the last Zoom cast that I did for Office Hours on Final Cut Pro. I was expecting it when I hit the record button after being asked to, that it would record those files in the cloud. It did not. It actually left them on my local drive. So that was kind of an aha moment to me that some of these services are storing files for records and things like that locally rather than in the cloud. And it's changed my thinking about how some of those things work and mm -hmm. how some yeah. of the access, other people know way more than me, but that was just surprising to me. Yeah, that, that's a that's a function in Zoom. You can say, I wanna, I wanna record locally or I wanna record in the cloud. And uh, if you record locally, you're gonna get a really high quality from, this is from Zoom. This is not streaming to YouTube, but uh, if you're gonna record locally, you'll get a very high quality recording. Recording into the cloud with Zoom is kind of like, I don't really care about this, but someone told me to do it. <laughs> like that's the quality you get out of it um, because it's it's uh, it's horrible. <laughs> I had to edit. I had to help. Uh, I had to help Carly to do one, and it was. I was like, "What am I looking at? <laughs> like, this is horrible. <laughs> like this is just completely un." un anyway, um, uh, so so the uh, but for YouTube specifically, 
there's a, a DVR setting. A DVR setting is uh, inside of it and whether people can go back and forth. The reason people turn that off is to keep the audience all in one place. Um, there's, well, there's two things. One is, but one is to keep them all synced together. That means that tweets come out together, that posts come out together, that the chat works, that the, you know, so by syncing, every, forcing everybody into a, into a synced experience, it creates a moment. And so that's what I think probably where Apple's coming from. And we, we have other clients that have done that over the, in the past um, is to turn that off. It also means that if something goes wrong, you, you, the, not that many people have it and it doesn't become as much of a meme. Um, someone's always going to be recording it and it still will show up, but it, it, it really it dramatically by 99.9999999% chance that it reduces the ability for people to get something that didn't work out as effectively as they could otherwise. No, I mean, pick at things. And so, you know, companies can be a little bit controlling about their brand, especially when, you know, you're, you're talking about a, um, like a bad event for an Apple thing would probably move the stock by a hundred billion dollars. Like it's, it's a huge, like it's a big, big numbers, you know, like if things go, you know, it'll probably recover, but cause that's stupid, but, but it would. And, and so they, they try to avoid a hundred billion dollar problems. Um, the next question is from Robert Soji in Los Angeles. And Robert says, Alex, can you tell us how it feels when you think about how much office hours means to this community that you, that you have created? Office hours and after hours has gone beyond just a show about answering AV technical questions. I'm always amazed. <laughs> like I, I talk about office hours probably too much with everyone around me, but I'm just like, you no idea like what's happen actually happening here. Like this is something you want to pay attention to, you know, and, and I'm like, we're still working on it, but it's like where we are and where we've gone. Yeah. And it really was when it started, it was like, I, I've done a whole bunch of these kinds of events and no one else has. And I better get up there and start asking, answering questions. Cause I really believe truly that the future is, is making sure that there's a global conversation where no one's left out and we'll never do that with physical events that's my bone <laughs> with it, you know, like my bone to pick with, with physical events is that, is that it's, it's exclusionary um, uh, painfully. And it had to be for a while, but we're past that now, you know, and we don't need them anymore. And so, um, you know, like we can, we can move past that and it, they still offer op op an opportunity for a bunch of people to come together, but we have to find ways that, that, that the online audience has first person experience, you know, for, you know, first class experience uh, as opposed to a, you know, cargo experience, you know, which is what we have right now for most shows. Um, the, the, uh, I, I, yeah. So that's all I have to say is that the quality, the quantity and quality of who showed up for this amazes me every single day. Like every single day I'm inspired by what I see in discord and all the things that are happening and the people that are supporting the program and the people who just show up and the people who find people to bring in for Tuesday or Tuesdays or Thursdays or Fridays. And it's just an amazing thing, you know, and it's why I, you know, try to come up almost every day and I, I, I miss it by, and I, and I think I miss the community when I'm not part of that either. You know, the, I was really frustrated. I had, to, had a meeting that I had planned for a long time in LA with some executives that I can't, I can't tell them. I, 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 I'm sorry, I have an Apple event. I can't <laughs> to hang out with my friends. I can't come to your meeting. That would have been awkward anyway. Um, and so, uh, but I found myself very frustrated and I was like, oh, I can't believe I just can't sit down. And I got to hang out with everyone for a little while, but I was really, you know, not had to, had all these moving parts and I was really frustrated because I really enjoy those moments of us all hanging out and, and geeking out together. So, so it's, uh, it's, I get, I get at least as much out of it as everybody here, you know, and I learn a lot and, and get an enormous amount of fulfillment from it. So it's, uh, and, I, and for some reason, this, this works for me really well. I think it's just because it's just a lot of incredible people and I have very short, I have a very short attention span. <laughs> I, have, I have a very short attention span for, uh, small talk. And so, um, the rest of life is I, I don't like to interact that much. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so I, I really enjoy the conversations we have here. Uh, next question is um, from uh, John Nichols in Concord, California. Congratulations on 900 shows. What a milestone, Alex. Uh, are you able to expand on your idea of a virtual showroom and conference uh, that is uh, available in many regions? I started talking about how the keynotes might happen through IzzyCast. The, the concept that I'm thinking about right now for a showroom is 
So right now we spend a lot of money. So we charge people a lot of money to be in a conference room and they have their conference and they have a 20 by 10 or a 20 by 20 or a, or a um, 40 by 40. And the problem is, is that they're all, number one is that variance in size creates chaos on the show floor. It also um, is very hard to cover and it's also very loud. Um, and all those things make it hard for us to bring that expo to the rest of the world. And my goal is to get to a point where you're able to bring the expo to the rest of the world. Now, there's a lot of people that have built all these CG, you know, BS things. And sorry, excuse my language, even for the initials, I shouldn't do that. Anyway, um, but the, you know, all these CG booths and everything else I have no time for. Um, my goal is to figure out how to create an expo that truly is something that we can bring to the whole audience online where every booth is designed for to be online you know so it's not so and and the thing is is that we have to build it that way so that the booths are set up now where i've gone with that is a little bit towards um what we so if you're in the press so when you look at all the expos that are out there there's the expo and then there's there's the press expo, which is a very different experience. So as someone in the press, we get to go to CES Unveiled and um, Pepcom and uh, Showstoppers. And these are basically, uh, these are another conference that are, about, that are almost all 10 foot tables. There's not a lot of noise. There's, they feed us <laughs> and, 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 and ply us with drinks. Um, and when you walk around and you get to talk to usually the CE, you know, the CMO, the, the product managers, the, you know, they put the best people in these. It's a much better experience, just in case you're wondering then. I mean, it, it, you, you kind of get to a point where you feel like I don't really need, I would never need to go to the expo if I could just do this. And so part of my thought process is how do we make that great? Because right now it's a little, I mean, it's, it's good. It's a, it's a huge improvement, but it's kind of hacked together. So what I've been looking at right now, the design that I have, and we're going to be kind of working through this is to think about booths like this, where we basically build a 20 by 10 booth and the booths are back to back like this. So the row, so if you think about it, and this would be probably much, you know, be deeper, something like this. Um, so what happens is, is, and then the idea is that each one of these is all, uh, they all have carpet on them. And the reason you put carpet on it is number one is it cuts down on the reflection of the sound a lot. It's all gray carpet, dark gray carpet. Um, and all you need to put things up on the walls. So the, one of the big problems with booths is loading in, <laughs> you know, like so loading in all that, all that stuff just to pull, pull things up and everything else. So these have carpet on them and all you need to do is put a little bit of um, Velcro on the back of whatever you want to put up there and it'll just stick to it. So you can, you, so that someone can customize what they want here. Then the other thing is, is to build a table here and it kind of comes with this. And then we build the sound and a basic camera system um, here that's all there so that someone can um, be part of, you know, be part of that expo. Um, now we may put this somewhere off to one side or the other, but pretty much. And then the other thing is, is that as this camera looks back and forth, you wouldn't see anyone next to it. So this actually is a really, this will pack more booths in than the standard 10 by 10 or 10 by 20s that you have now, because they're not, they're, they're kind of interweaved and we would build them so that they're relatively thick. You really don't hear. So when you're in this space, you're really in that space, you know, and you're able to talk to that person. Then the idea is, is that they can have their own zoom rooms and their own things that they want to do. Um, but they can be constantly doing it and the rest of their staff can be online, <laughs> like, you know, can be in breakout rooms and everything else that basically allow them to, uh, you come in and talk, oh, you want to talk to another specialist? We have somebody else that can do that with you. Um, so that if people are coming to the conference, there's still somewhere for people to walk and talk to folks and everything else. But this person can spend that other time, you know, really talking to people about it and showing things that are physical. But it also means that if you're covering the show, so if we have, this is really built for people to cover the show. If you're covering the show, we basically build it so that, you know, different camera crews and we would be one of the camera, if we were running the conference, we'd be one of the camera crews can go booth to booth and talk to people about it and answer questions so that that camera coming to each booth represents a thousand or 2000 or 5,000 people all at one time, <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's, a you know, so from a camera crew perspective, I don't have to log everybody in. I can go through and just, and just have, do all the things that we're doing in IBC and NAB, but in a very efficient, 
from a camera crew perspective. And it doesn't have to be us, anybody else could do it. So the thing is, is that if we built it this way, uh, you'd end up with more camera crews, more people covering it because it would be, you know, and these would be 12 foot walls. We'd, we'd put grids over them, light them. You know, everything's kind of built in for you. The, you. It wouldn't cost you, it would cost you about the same amount of money as you'd go to a, another booth, except that you'd have way more stuff that's built for an online experience. Um, and so anyway, that's my current thought process on it that I'm kind of working through and we're gonna hopefully test it in the not too distant, maybe not this year, but early in the spring. Probably gonna, even if we have to build our own conference, we're gonna, we're gonna do it just so I can see if it works. Cause that's, that, it works in my head right now, but we won't know until we do it, go ahead, Bill. So I was interested in the IBC coverage. I thought the the technical stuff all worked great, but I was really surprised at behavior in some of the booths when we went to visit them. Specifically, two instances really stuck with me and have kind of informed where I think this is going. First was one of the demo uh, folks that the field crew went to, to interview. You could just tell they had been giving a series of talking points. And even in, when we tried to interact, when our booth reporter tried to interact with them, you could tell they just needed to get their points out. They weren't really used to something other than their old methodology of these are the things I have to say, and I have to say them this way. I practice, practice, practice. And it was hard to get them out of conversation. The other thing that was really important to me is in one of the booths, the actual, uh, our crew showed up, there was a live demo with actual customers going on. And I think it was the marketing director who was bringing us around, literally said, we're coming in, you guys move aside. This is more important than your one-on-one -on -one with the customer right now. And that was really informative to me. People are starting to get it. And that's the whole thing is that you build these for the online audience, you know, and it doesn't, the, the, what I'm talking about is building something that if you're a in-person audience, you can still go through those booths and you can still, you know, experience those and have the conversations that you want to have. But if you are, um, if, if you're, if, but it's built for the online audience where, I um, mean, because it's horribly inefficient to keep talking to one person after another. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I'm just wondering if your idea of this virtual uh, conference uh, incorporates itself into the, now I don't, I'm not a Facebook member into the metaverse. Uh, so that something like that, you could build a virtual showcase uh, in the metaverse and have each individual booth be a virtual showroom uh, set up like you you showed with a, a live I mean, interaction uh, with a person. I think people that people would go from point to point. In yeah, the I don't think I need. I don't think I need the metaverse for it. I think is is the only thing I would do is is that I would have a a thing where I just told you what it was, showed you pictures of it. I wouldn't try to rebuild the 3D experience of walking through it. I mean, you know, that's a little part of hell that I've lived through for the last 30 years is having to walk from booth to booth. I don't need to have a physical representation. That's the whole problem with the metaverse is that I don't need, there are things that I do need is video. Like I don't want to talk to an avatar about their product. Um, but the, but what I, but I, don't want to do is try to figure out where I have to walk to go from one thing to the next. I want to have something that just says, I'm interested in audio and it gives me a list of all the audio things with some logos and it shows what their new thing is and this is what they're talking about. And I just click on one and now I'm in a Zoom. Well, that's, <laughs> the, that's the beauty of a virtual type setup of a, a metaverse type setup. It, it can rearrange the, the conference facility based on your needs rather right. than just a layout. It, and that would be a groundbreaking. You know, I, yeah. think. I think, I think you're right. And, and I think that the, the problem right now is that every time someone talks about the metaverse, what they are imagining is building a physical environment that people are walking, you know, like not a physical, but a physical digital environment that people are wandering through. And they, I mean, literally I watched it during COVID. I was getting like artistic sketches of 3d versions of people's sets. I mean, it's a big business that people are trying to sell. And I'm like, oh, it's just so much work and so much money. I mean, it's like $300,000 for one of those digital sets. And I was like, and for what? <laughs> Why would I do that? Um, go ahead, George. So I'm curious about um, a couple of things. First, uh, just in case anyone didn't notice yesterday, the whole office hour crew in the Zoom booth, in the little uh, videos going in the background. Congrats, guys. That was pretty cool. Um, so... How difficult would it be in the future to have, I know as you move forward, it's great to have camera crews in a booth and just have talking points, but 
especially when you're dealing with apps, quick demos, would it be difficult to already have a boot maybe queued up in, in, in Zoom that we could actually pull in a demo of a piece of software or things that need to be demo? I think that'd be cool in the future if that could happen. Well, it should be a little bit easy if, if there's connectivity. I think that, I mean, well, in what I'm talking about, connectivity is something that comes with the booth. Like it's not something you pay extra for. You pay for the booth and one of the things you get is enough bandwidth to run your booth. You know, it's, it's absurd the way it's run right now. And um, and so the uh, so we would, you'd absolutely, and this will change the model, you know, and, and of course, you know, big conference centers won't like it, but the, the bottom line is we don't need big conference centers. You know, I need a warehouse to do this, you know, and so... Um, and so it'll be, you know, really complicated um, if folks, you know, don't let us move the model forward. But the, uh, I think that at first, we'll still have camera crews that go from one thing to the next. There's some point in the future where you rig up, to your point, George, you rig up everything where there's multiple cameras, there is um, the demo, the software demo, the everything else is built into the booth. Like all you have to do is plug your computer, HDMI output from your your computer, into the into the system and it it you know it comes with a mac mini it comes with you know under the desk so that eventually you don't have to send camera crews anywhere you simply bring the booth in the biggest problem with virtual events right now is that the vendors will not invest in what they need to look good <laughs> You know, it just ruins everything. Like you watch sound devices had their little sound, you know, not little, but they had their sound uh, conference. And what destroyed it was not sound devices. It was, it was the, you know, all the other vendors not wanting to spend the money that, you know, a small percentage of what they spend, like a, I'm not going to say who, but above average, just put it in perspective, an above average booth at CES, not the biggest booth there but not the smallest booth there. Just kind of, you know, you'd say, oh, that's a nice booth. It's pretty big. It's probably 40 by 40, that kind of thing. $4 million. $4 million for that booth. You know, and the thing is, and that's not all the people. <laughs> so, so add all the people and now you're at another, you know, $5 million, $6 million in for one booth at CES. Now, if you gave me $6 million, I could build you a studio and run it for a year in a way, if you took the whole, all your event, all your event budgets, you know, for a, for a fortune, you know, 100 or fortune 500 company, you know, I could build them a studio that would get far more impact on a daily basis every day, every day, eight hours of content a day about your product, you know? And um, so the biggest problem that we have right now is that the vendors aren't getting it, you know? And so by doing this, it would just be like, hey, we'll do it all for you. <laughs> and then what will happen is, is they'll, They'll, after they go home, they'll try to do it with their little webcams and their stupid little, you know, cheap mics and everything else. And they'll go, oh, it was so much nicer. And then they'll call us and go, so how do, what did you guys use at the booth? <laughs> and then we'll send them a list and someone to go put it together for them. But that's what, that's how you kind of bring them forward. Go ahead, George. I forgot my train of thought. Sorry, guys, you can, you can move on. No, so, so I think that, uh, but I think that this, I think, this is still kind of a hybridishy, hybridishy. <laughs> so um, it is a. We still have to serve the physical audience that's there, but we also want to serve the virtual audience and make sure both of them are there. But they're not interacting at the same time. Like when we go to that booth as a virtual audience, and the idea is that you, the booth could schedule times where it's going to be physical for the people that are there. But I think that, and you may think that, well, they won't have enough time. I firmly believe that we're going to get to a point where. 300, after all the things that we've done, the best number for a conference in person is 300. <laughs> like it's like it's the right, it's the right number of people to put into a room. Uh, it means that you don't have a bunch of multiple sessions. You keep it all connected. You have people there. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean you can't do ones up to 1,000, 2,000. They just, it, I find that 300 is like the pinnacle of, of you know, the, you, you pick the right people to be in there for 300 people and it turns into just the, these really magical conversations and it just starts to slowly water out after that. Go ahead, Blue. Yeah, I was just going to say, I love what you're talking about from a conference perspective and how to get sponsors um, into a virtual environment. I think the biggest problem that we have though isn't technology, it's the sponsors. Oh yeah. And having them understand how to interact with virtual attendees and the value there. I mean, We've had a few events where we've had not huge trade shows, but, you know, 20 sponsors or so. And 
because of how we trained them, like we literally spent hours training the sponsors on how to manage virtual, mm -hmm. they wound up coming back to us and saying, that was the best experience I've ever had from a conference, not a virtual yeah. conference, not an in-person conference, just from a yeah. conference. Because once they understand how to interact, they have access to so many more attendees because the attendee, it's so much easier for the attendees to go into the virtual booths yeah. than it is in person. And it's easier to have conversations. There's less, um, especially for those of us who are introverts, there's less barrier, right? Walking up to somebody in a booth is a lot, I think anyway, a lot more uh, yeah. <laughs> difficult than just popping into a Zoom room and all of a sudden you're having a conversation. Right, and the, so. the goal that I have for the expo is that it's a slightly, it's a tweak to what they're used to. They still get to have a physical booth. It's still there. They've seen small booth situations. I mean, you know, they, that where you go into a conference. Black Magic has a giant conference, but when you go to the, you know, the, um, I spoke at the, uh, there's a the Ivy, IVRS. Um, it's the, it's, it's just a graphics conference for the intelligence community. And, you know, Black Magic has like a 10 foot booth. <laughs> like you know, it's not like they put up a big, you know, they got like an hour to put it up. So um, along with Avid and everybody else that, that talks to that industry. Um, and there's, four, there's only 400 people there because that's the entire community. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, but it's a much smaller thing. So they understand small. The idea is, is to build it all out. So they understand it and they go, this is like, it's a small thing, but once they see it, because to your point, Blue, uh, a physical event ignores 99.9999999% of your addressable market globally. Like that, and when when you say it that way, I think sometimes it's starting to sink in for people I talk to of like, oh, right, there's a bigger market out there. And the worst part is that if you don't do virtual events well, that 99.99999% is less and less likely to show up. And the, and the most devastating part of it is they might even on your first one, they might even give you thumbs up because it's not what they think, it's how they feel. We get back into this kind of lower brain thing. Do they feel like it's a priority to see the next one? Do they feel like it's important to, to watch that to, to go? And if they don't feel that when they're busy, their kids are going back to school, it's a little rainy, all those things have them just not show up. And they might have even told you, you did a great job. Like that's the, that's the craziest part of this and you'll never get them back. Like, it, you know, like you're so not having great virtual events is devastating to, to a brand. Go ahead, uh, Blue. Well, and I, I think to a certain extent, we've already been put behind by people who have pretended mm. to have digital trade oh, yeah. shows that have just absolutely been atrocious and bad or worse, experiences. Just boring. Yeah. It's right. Boring. So, I mean, we have some of our, some of our event, event hosts who are seeing their sponsors basically say, we're not sponsoring anything that's virtual. Right. And the reason why is because they've had bad experiences, right? Because yeah. they went to trade shows run by people who are not part of office hours, who have no idea what they're doing, who was like, yeah, here's a zoom link. Yeah. And that was yeah. it. Oh yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a little bit of an uphill mountain, um, that well, we have to climb as, and community. again, I think, I think we're covering a lot of events right now. It, it we may go after doing some, you know, next year or the year after mostly so that not so much as a, we're trying to turn that into a business and more of a, we need to show people what something like this could look like. What is a virtual conference? What could a virtual conference actually look like if we turned all the dials, you know, all the way up so that people can be, uh, you know, hopefully inspired and sometimes shamed <laughs> into into moving forward, uh, uh, Courtney. And my fear is that if we move to this virtual conference uh, uh, concept, that uh, we get into a situation like we're in right now, which is information siloing, that we we curate our list of booths and it organizes them so that we just see the ones we want to see, and it removes that serendipity of you know, on our way between the, you know, Sony booth and the Black Magic booth, we discover some of those little booths in the middle that we never would see if we were, if the Sony booth and the Black Magic booth are right next to each other, you know, so it kind of removes some of that serendipitous discovery uh, if it's all, you know, packaged and organized for that serves just our interests and uh, we become siloed right. and we only see the stuff we want to see and we never discover I anything new. I completely agree. In fact, I, you know, in the future coverage of the events, um, 
you know, of NAB and CES and the next NAB and other, any other conferences that we do, I really want to, you know, have a filter for the, what we're going to cover of, do we think we could get them onto office hours for, for a second hour? You know, and unless there's someone like Liminal or slash Zoom or someone that we're really close to, you know, in that area, you know, we really focus on the small, like most of what I have done when I cover events is I don't even, I, I mean, I might show something at Sony, but I don't spend much time at Sony or Blackmagic. I spend all my time, to your point, Courtney, at the booths that I, when I cover an event, I cover the event that where I don't think you're going to see the press release and I don't think you're going to see this booth. And I want to um, make sure that you see something cool that they're producing. I'm more interested in booths that are like most of my focus is on booths that are less than 20 feet, 20 by 20, you know, 20 by 20, 10 by 10. Those are the, the ones that I focus on generally when I'm covering things, because I feel like that's what I, that's what you really, you know, get, can, you know, that's what you get at the events, you know, and the feel of them. So so I think that you're right. And I think that, but I think it can be even better for a lot of these, a lot of these, um, you know, one of the problems right now is that your smaller companies look way smaller, you know, like black magic makes everybody look really tiny, you know, uh, around them. Even they make even grass Valley look a little tiny <laughs> across the hall, across the thing. And so, uh, in this case, you're kind of evening out the playing field, which is that, you know, with a bunch of good cameras and a bunch of, you know, with some or relatively good cameras and good mics and everything else, a small company, you know, like, like, for instance, I was thinking about it, uh, watching Andy, Andy is like a machine, you know, like yesterday, I was just so amazed as someone who presents to walk up to someone and have someone do it off the top of their head on that first explanation, the first hit we did during IBC, companies are going to need more and more people that can do that. I can sit there and just go, and he had somehow, he had structure in his head about what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. He didn't need a, he didn't need a, a, a teleprompter or anything else. And he just ran through that and gave us, it was all protein you know, all the way through. And, but anybody can do that. They don't need to be a big giant company to do that. If I remember when Emery was getting started with Frame.io, Emery's like that. Like Emery can sit there and just have a conversation and, tell you everything succinctly and he edits it all out in his head and, and everything else. He used to be a host with us. Um, and, um, so it doesn't have to be, but he was a little company, but he became a big company because he was able to, um, he understood his market and he understood his tech. Now go ahead. But that's what you want it to be about is that they can understand it. Not that they're going to get lost in between, you know, the, uh, the big booths. Go ahead, George. So Courtney, you have a good point, but, um, what I would say as many of us that watch coverages of, of these shows, I think what Office Hours has tapped into is we sat here yesterday and watched 90 minutes of coverage without having to go to 10 different channels to look at those announcements or that coverage. I think what, what, what we're doing here is setting the pace for the future of how conferences are covered, like we all are discussing here. So I think you have a good point, yes, but also, I think this is the future because now I don't have to go look at 10 different channels. I could just scrub back and forth and look at the sections I miss. So, you know, we might, we might be covering 10 boots now, but in the future it could be more. So, you know, that's going to expand. You know, we could have multiple channels during the day. You're going to be able to go back and watch without having to go into 20 different yeah. blogs or whatever the case may be to get that coverage. And I think that, you know, we can, one thing we'll probably exper experiment with with NAB is some of those those um, packages, those go out on their own. And imagine having a larger group that just suddenly, suddenly there's huge numbers of packages, you know, going out um, in into office hours. So there's a shelf that is the NAB New York or CES or whatever. And there's just all those little packages that are just going out as individual coverage. And then we're mostly the live coverage is going to a handful of booths talking about things philosophically, looking at the things that we want to, you know, um, kind of long form content while all the hits are going out separately. And the amount of coverage that we could provide for that would be pretty profound. Um, again, because it's a large number of people that are, you know, volunteering time. I mean, I think over time we want to be able to cover things, but volunteering their time and effort to serve the rest of the community, um, it could get to be something that is much more scalable than anything that's been done in the past. Because it doesn't, at the scale that we're working, there's no financial way to do it. Like there's no, there's no, uh, if it doesn't, isn't done by the way, the way we're doing it now, 
you know, it'll never turn into a business. Like it's just, it's just not, you can't do it at that scale. Now we could do smaller ones where we build it and we're doing it for something and we're doing it for a specific sponsor that's paying for a certain thing. But to do the kind of mass coverage that we're talking about is not a, not sustainable as a business. Now go ahead, but we can do it. Go ahead, Blue. Uh, yeah, I, I think George and Courtney are talking about two very different things, right? Courtney's talking about the experience as an attendee, just kind of walking around the booth. Mm -hmm. and, George, and George, to a certain extent, is talking about what office hours did in terms of covering specific things at at the uh, at IBC. And Courtney, I think what you're talking about is something that event planners have been trying to solve, like, I don't know, since the beginning of event planning, right? How do we get all sponsors to get as much traffic as possible? And it's, it's funny, we have a whole bunch of tricks up our sleeve in terms of how to do that. And I think those things become much easier virtually. Um, I also think it's a lot easier. Yeah, like we've all seen the apps, right? When you go to a conference and like, oh, if you like this booth, you may like this one. And it's like, this is how you get to that booth. Well, with virtual, you can do stuff that's similar to that, but it's just a click. And now I'm talking to that person. I don't have to walk four rows over, five rows back, and maybe a building across in order to get to, to that booth that is something similar. A lot of those things, that discovery of smaller booths, I think actually if, you, if we just put, a, I mean, there's a lot of smart people on this line. If we just put a tiny bit of thought into it, it can be better than the in-person experience by a long shot. It's well, not even close. And one of the things that, that gets me there is every morning at NAB, you get this little newspaper from NAB, you get the, 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 this little thing. I go through that. I don't look at any of the articles because I know they're all, you know, made, you know, they're just PR, but I do look at all the ads. <laughs> I look at all the pictures of like what's being released and, oh, that looks cool. And then I look at what booth number they are and I make my little, my little hit list of, okay, when I'm in the North Hall, Central Hall, South Hall, these are some booths that I saw. No, like that advertising is probably the most important thing to me as a user that someone can do. Even if it's a little ad, it'll be something. And usually, I, and the thing is, is to, to Blue's point, I usually have things like one week, one year I came and I was like, I'm looking for satellite uplink technology. And so I spent the whole time in between the North Hall and the Central Hall and the Sun, you know, talking to all these satellite distributors. And and so the, but I'm, you know, trying to buy a dish. <laughs> so, so, it, so it's a, but one year I was like, it's all comms. So I'm going to go look at every comms system that I'm trying to look for. And I think eventually the coverage can get very complex depending on how we do this, where there's a, again, and the cool thing is, is that as the, if the booths were pre-built for this and they're simple and they're the same and they're, but they're pre-built for how this works, so they work well, we're not sending a camera crew through. We're just jumping from booth to booth. We just bring that booth in, you know, they're, they're in comms, they're in everything else. And we say, okay, clear comm, we're coming to you in five, four, three, two, one. And now their booth is just brought into our experience, but there might be, there could be different tours for different people. So there could be a comms tour or an audio tour and ClearCom might get pulled into both of those, you know, at different times, you know? And so the thing is, is that now at some point they're going to get their head around the idea that they probably don't need to go to a conference <laughs> to do this. They just need a good studio, but we're going to fix the studio problem for them because that's what we have to fix for them. We have to give them the hardware to do this because they're not, uh, they just don't have their head around what it takes to, to make a good, to look and sound good yet. And, and that's part of what Office Hours has to keep on pushing is the high mark of like, this is what you could look like. I was talking to someone who just said, when I'm trying to explain like what Zoom can do and what Zoom ISO does, the only way to do that is to have them go watch uh, Office Hours. <laughs> like, you know, like the only way to do that is just send, like, this is what this could look like if, if, if it was done correctly, you know, and they, 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 they send it to us. Um, and we're still figuring it out. Um, next question is uh, from Hasma Kagashar in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, we have another 100 episodes in which to plan for the 1,000 episode. It would be awesome if we bring into that episode as many of the regulars since episode one as possible. John Preto can take charge, question mark. John's like, no, no. <laughs> Go ahead, Hasma. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this previous discussion reminded me of don't think about the future, but make the future. And my question is almost now for something completely different. Nice. Um, on, on Friday, uh, Beiju popped into after hours and Leo also popped in. And I just realized we haven't seen a, a number of people who've been part of uh, office hours for a long time. 
And John Petro has the most detailed record of all the folks and how many times. I mean, I'm scared to think about what he has in terms of information. So for the thousandth episode, I was thinking instead of having a show, we have almost like a class reunion and cycle it over a period of time and, and, and promote as much as we can and reach out to as many of office hour uh troopies to come into the show for that day and just have a conversation and catch up because it was wonderful to talk to Beiju and Leo. Yeah. And I think that uh, I resisted doing something crazy for today, um, but the thousandth episode, I, one thing I don't like, Josh and I had a conversation about this this morning. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I don't want to do is start creating, I don't like holidays. <laughs> Like I don't like special days. I like the next day to be the ne the most important day. And so, you know, what we do every day is important to me. What, you know, and so um, I do think it's important for us to have these to look back, but I want to make, I, I don't want to do it every hundred days. Like, I think that we're going to do it. We're going to have a big one. And I do think that every thousand days we should probably take stock in what happened over the last thousand days because it'll be a big jump. I also think the yearly anniversaries are good, but I think I'd like, after this one, I think we're going to cap it to that as far as, 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 far as our, our celebrations a little bit. Um, but the, uh, but what I will say is that I do plan, what, do we remember, do we know what day this is? December, I, I think December 19th. 19th. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so December 19th uh, is, um, will, and what day is that? What is the day of the week is then? Copy. Yep. Somebody says Monday. Monday, Monday. Monday, yeah. So, um, anyway, so we're going to, that will probably be a long day. Uh, I'm not going to make it just a second hour. <laughs> so, so we'll probably. Well, you could, you could alter it to, you could move it to Sunday. No, no, I don't want to move it. No more on Sunday. No more on Sunday. No more streaming on Sunday. It's not, it's not I don't want to ever do this. Monday again. sounds awesome. So, so anyway, uh, so the, um, uh, so yeah, so we'll do, um, uh, we'll, we'll I'll take the day off. <laughs> you know, and so, so there'll probably be, um, you know, a, a, I think we'll probably a couple hours of, of us looking at stuff. I think we want to go back and take our time and really turn it into something where we kind of, I have, I do have a recording of the first day. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so the, uh, so go back and grab some of the older ones, uh, grab some of the moments, like build out some video packages, build out, you know, thing, you know, parts of the things that we want to talk about, look at, and then look to the future as well. So, and I don't think it'll fit into a two hour session. So we'll, we'll work on that. Go ahead, Bill. Well, it just, there's so many people. I mean, that's the thing that I missed. I think back every once in a while, I think like I hadn't thought of Beijing in a while and I miss him. And there's so many people I miss from the early days of this show that have come, been a great communicator, great part of this, and then have left. So I'm wondering if there's any sense in trying to build for that thousand, some little inserts. Can we reach out to some of those people that we love interacting with who are gone now and maybe get them to do like a 15 or 20 second, just here I am, I'm doing this. It was great to be on office hours and I'm fine. And maybe do the first four months and then, you know, it, so three. Bill, per, if we only, if we only knew an editor, Bill, well, I'd be happy to work on the process, but I just think I want to see people. I want to see all the people yeah. that I've loved being a part of this with that I haven't seen in six months. You yeah. know, oh, Chris is gone. And, and oh, I haven't seen, I, there's just so many people yeah. that I, I miss. Know, I think that, I think that we'll, 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 uh, we'll definitely go through and, and think about all those things. Go ahead, Hosman. Yeah, I think for office hours, the most important thing for me is the emotional connection especially during COVID, we had to go through that. But I don't think we've lost that. I think we still have the camaraderie and we still have that ethos and culture. And it's very useful to revisit that and remind ourselves of that. Yeah, absolutely. Next question uh, is uh, from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he said, office hours covering trade shows has become a staple. We've covered NAB, NAM, Cinegear, now IBC, but it started with OH Space, um, where we became unsatisfied with John's rocket launch being a pedestrian event. What uh, will trigger the next evolution? Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, maybe I can qualify that a little bit. Alex, I know that you had mentioned, I believe, in all the lore that what you had set out to do with office hours is not what it become. So I'm curious, Alex in particular, where were these little bends in the road, these turns where it went a direction that you weren't expecting for better, uh, hopefully for better. And, um, you know, what points do you think 
uh, well, some looking at back. I think, then looking I think a lot of times I have things that work in my head that I just haven't seen yet. And so then when I see them, something else, some d- new door opens up, you know, that I go, oh, this is, this is actually, you know, like I go, oh, I think this might be cool. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is just how many people have taken over without really any, <laughs> any prodding. They just keep people keep on taking on responsibility and keep on building up. I think that's the thing that, that we keep on seeing is people doing those things, um, which I think is really what makes the community what it is. The, I mean, I think that, you know, I'd covered a lot of conferences. Um, Pixel Core had covered uh, maybe 30 conferences. So it's, you know, it's as a group, we had done this in the past. Um, you know, and pretty, you know, sometimes we had 20 people on the ground, you know, like doing, doing these in Mac world and, and other things like that. And so, um, those aren't necessarily new other than doing them. I think that the thing that I really saw yesterday was, you know, while there were a couple kinks here and there, the, the fact that we had people seamlessly talking from anywhere in the world to people on the ground, you know, with it, there were moments, it didn't always work, but there were moments where it worked really well. And, and so I look at things like I can see something there. Like with the very first cooking thing we did with Damianti, I saw something. Like I was like, oh, I, I see how that could, you know, like that could work. That when we did the Raspberry Pi, you know, um, event, I saw something there. You know, the, the OH space one was like, oh, I see, you know, I see something. And I can see the door open to that. I have ideas that those kinds of things would be good. But I don't, I, I'm very much like I have to see it to, under, to understand it. And so, um, so those are some of the windows, you know, that I, that I think I, that I saw. Go ahead, John. I, I don't, the, the back, back end team reached out for me, uh, for content. And I gave them a video that we shot a composite of the video and Dennis has edited it down to 45 seconds. If we got the time, Alex, they'd like to, if roll. it's ready, if it's ready to roll, roll it. Yeah. And I think that the the thing was that we the rocket itself was impressive, but as John has pointed out in the past, part of what really was impressive was just this. What I was the most impressed by by the whole launch was people coming from all literally all over the world to be part of the conference, and then people being part of it. And I think that there's going to be a growing opportunity for us to see that happen more and more and more, um, where we're going to have a physical event that we're going to work on together like we did with IBC. But there's this larger virtual group that gets to be part of that too, because that physical event, because people showed up, but it's not showing up like a bunch of spectators. Everybody's showing up is doing something, you know, that's, that's part of that. I've had this dream of doing something um, in Africa where I want to go from Addis Ababa to, to Cape Town and have uh, a caravan you know, of people, you know, that have experts from local talent, from every country. So going through Kenya and Tanzania and Rwanda and, you know, and, 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 and have all of those, but all of us together going all the way through it. So we can compare and contrast, but stop at little villages along the way, um, you know, do interviews, you know, with folks there, talk about what that is, show what that, the, what the, what that country really looks like, not what we see on the news and have people be able to experience it, have them be able to buy all the, buy everything that, that, that they're selling. You know, like, cause if you, if you had it big enough with an online thing, you can just go to a village and go, and we'll buy all the wicker baskets, you know, like, you know, and, and, you know, they're all sold by the, you know, they just, we just put them in a back at, a, 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 you know, a box truck and send them, uh, you know, to everybody that, that kind of thing I think would be really fascinating and be a huge boom for the folks that are, that are uh, on the ground as well. Like the people that when we visit, we want it to be something that has a positive impact on, on what they're doing. Um, Josh. And I don't think for the OH space thing, maybe that video didn't quite capture it, but really it was everything around that actual event. It was the host from 
you know, from across the globe, it was the people watching there. It was all of the production that had gone in before it. And it really beat built out of that would have been a pedestrian event of just watching a, a locket into the, into the sky that accomplished a practical thing about getting John's certification. But we made out of it, the production, something much more than what it was. And it was yeah. the community that sort of snowballed around that, that really made that event. Oh, absolutely. And that's the best way. I mean, when people talk about like, in, in my opinion, when people talk about networking, when people talk about networking, a lot of times they talk about like handing out their cards at conferences, which means almost nothing to me. But it's, it's the, the conversations we have here allow me to see people, you know, in a different way. The conversations in after hours lets me get a sense of who people are, but and then doing things with people either virtually or physically allows me to you, you get to see who people are when they're in a project. And so I think it's, um, it's fascinating to watch. Uh, next question is um, from Seventh Scroll in Brooklyn, New York. Um, morning, guys, 900. Was Preto able to find out the top five panelists in attendance since day one? John? So we have the data. I gave a um, screen cap to the guys. I have a March 27th screen cap that they're supposed to show. Um, and I have all that data um, and we're compiling it now. So maybe for the thousandth show, we'll have that ready or, or sooner. That's great. Uh, next question is from uh, Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington. Sky asks uh, Blue Melnick, uh, if you could share, what difference do you see between what difference do you see between OH and the big live virtual events you create? Go ahead, Blue. Um, yeah, I think the the biggest difference between what we do and what Office Hours is is the style of event. So Office Hours tends to be very much a panel driven event. And people who aren't on the panel watch in a brought from a broadcast perspective, right? They're watching on YouTube or maybe they're, I think some of them are still watching in Zoom somehow. Um, but there's no interaction with those people outside of the chat. And uh, the main difference with with what we do is everybody who watches um, one of our events comes in through Zoom meeting, has the opportunity to see everybody else. Um, and we do a lot of interaction. Um, I, I take a little bit more of a liberal approach with giving people the mic uh, than Alex does, um, which sometimes serves well and sometimes is a raging disaster. Um, but generally speaking, uh, tends to create a lot of connection and community, which is the big thing, one of the big things that we're trying to uh, trying to create with the large scale events that we produce um, outside of delivering amazing content. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, it's just in how the attendees interact with the event itself. Um, a lot of the tech that's in use uh, to create office hours is a lot of the same stuff that that we use um, in our studios. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the stuff that we do is is largely um, was largely driven by a conversation that Alex and I had. I had to go back and look. It was like March 23rd of 2020 was the first conversation that we had around, um, you know, around virtual events. And um, I had this crazy idea and Alex helped me solidify it. And then, you know, I talked to a bunch of people from the office hours community uh, and sometime at the beginning of April, we did our first one um, largely because of this community. Um, so a lot of what we've been able to do over the course of the last two and a half years is because of the information that's shared so openly um, here. Um, so I, yeah, um, I didn't say very much in the initial question, which was, what do you, uh, you know, what's one of your top memories from office hours? And, uh, I would just say that, um, the ability to do what we do on a daily basis, um, is my top memory from office hours. Cause without it, we wouldn't be able to, you know, and that's the, the, um, our goal is to always be this reservoir for everybody else doing stuff. You know, that, that there's a, this pool that you can go back to that has the answers and has support and has potentially people and have, you know, the resources that you need so that everyone's out there doing their own thing. But there's this kind of, uh, again, a big reservoir of knowledge that keep, people can keep them dipping back into as they need it um, to make that work. The, the reason that we don't open that up to a lot of other people during office hours, so after hours is a different thing, but in office hours, you know, the goal is to um, create something that people can listen to, you know, like you could tune into and just listen to and, and, and it's, you know, relatively good audio and it's relatively, you know, organized so that I, mean, I know that I'm like, I'm, I do these shows now with Michael Krasny. And um, one of the things that I really loved about Forum was the beginning where they were have, having these things, but they had callers, like people call in. The reason we don't do, do that is because it's it was very upsetting for me to listen to people with bad audio. <laughs> so it was just like, oh my gosh. And the problem 
to, for all the good things that happen, it's people getting on the mic and, you know, droning on about something no one cares about and then ending with a question that wasn't really a question. It was just an excuse to say what they wanted to say. And, 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 and I just, I really, after doing uh, hundreds and low thousands of events with that part of the puzzle, I desperately wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> like so, so, I, per, I persuaded the World Bank to, to get rid of it. So, so it's like, yeah, like, most yeah. speakers just don't know how to handle somebody that is droning on at the mic. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, especially corporate speakers, yeah. um, they really don't know how to handle it. Well, and they're put in a position where they 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 don't want to clip somebody. You know, it, it looks bad. And so like someone like a Tony Robbins that does it every day will know exactly how to guide that conversation and ask, the, you know, dig into it immediately um, as opposed to letting people just keep going. Um, but but the average person, you, you know, you're you're in a it's a different relationship with the people on stage than with when someone's doing a, you know, a. a personal thing where part of interrupting you is part of the part of the show you know so um yeah next question is from mitchell hill in wilmington delaware he says after hours has mysteriously quit around 6 p.m every eastern time in the last few days what do you suppose is happening leland i'm just going to stab in the dark here because i'm not familiar with the exact error maybe mitchell can fill us in a little bit on what he's witnessing is it zooms leaving you behind or is it leaving everybody behind at after hours go ahead mitchell first question yeah, everybody, it just shuts down and kicks everybody out. And then it uh, it attempts to bring you back in, but it puts you in a breakout room before you can get entered into the, the main um, after hours. Uh, and the other thing that uh, Brandon's asking me to remind everybody, this has nothing to do with the uh, off, uh, after hours reset that happens uh, at midnight UTC. It's this different and it acts yeah. differently. Yeah. No, I was on a different tangent. I was thinking if this was a single singularity issue where it was just you, I would say it was something to do with either your partitioning or your modem from your ISP, which can sometimes take place at a regular interval where they'll come in and reset your modem or reset your uh, router for updates. And that's something that can be a regular basis. So watch for that. But yeah, it's everybody that, I, that's in the room. So we should, we should keep tracking it. Um, you know, two is probably not enough to draw a straight line, but if we get it three or four more times, I think that we, we want to write down, everyone should just, when it's happening and you're there, write down the exact time. Like just, just so that we keep tracking, is it, is it kind of six o'clock or is it 603 or is it 557? All of those things help a lot, you know, in figuring those things out. Um, but if it happens a couple more times, um, yeah, if it happens a couple more times, we will, um, uh, we can file a ticket, you know, and I can, and, um, uh, but yeah, give me exact times and then we'll, we'll keep on working. 555 last two days. Mickey says it acts like a reflector crash. But is it exactly 555 and it wasn't the same between the two days is the question that I have. I'll do a better job of tracking. So th no, that's all. I mean, that, it's just being that, that level of specificity makes it much easier to, you know, find the, um, find the problem. Uh, uh, next question is from James Babbitt in, uh, uh, it says, congratulations on 900 office hours shows. The audio on office hours, uh, audio sound, or the audio on office hours audio sounds great. Has uh, OH continues, as OH continues to develop, will OH be broadcast on terrestrial radio in the US? That is our goal. There's a couple things that we have to do. You know, do, number one is we have to really kind of guarantee that everybody's audio will be good all the time. Um, there's a couple things we have to do, especially with guests, um, to kind of work that out. And the second thing is, is that um, we have to figure out the way that, you know, we have to be starting and stopping exactly on time. Um, we have to also create a couple breaks. And so what I'm looking at is adding some news breaks, some updates of things um, so that we can, uh, we have something that is good for us that is, you know, not ads, but we're basically creating something that we would literally ID as, you know, at, uh, um, at, 728 there's like a two minute window where we're going to put stuff into it that we want to do on our end and it's going to have to be to the second you know, then it and then it comes out you know and so i'm thinking through like what are those things but like every hour there might be two minutes or or three minutes of something that is good for us internally and is is not seen as a as an ad or as a stoppage or anything else but it gives broadcast um, partners somewhere to put ads, you know, like, and, and I think that, that, so we're, I'm trying to think through that process. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're getting closer. Uh, not everybody needs that, but most people will like, no one's going to carry it live if they don't have, like, we can always package it later that way. 
and make that available. But if we want a live audience, and I'm really interested in the idea of radio stations all over the world carrying our show live because it means that we have this giant audience that is able to listen to it as well as eventually be able to carry it on TV. But we have to figure out the structure of, of providing it. And for, you know, it doesn't work for the, con the countries where we might be in prime time, but it does work for the countries that we're doing overnight. <laughs> you know, like so, you know, and, and places that don't have a lot of uh, original content. So, so I think that, that there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And again, it's just a matter of outreach and making it more available to more people is what I'm really focused on. So, um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep on working on that. Uh, next question is from uh, Colin Mulcahy in uh, Dublin, Ireland. What kind of, if any, redundancy workflow have you discussed around Zoom ISO for shows? For example, could you have a duplicate ATEM set up for a Zoom co-host? Yeah, we could. So eventually we will have a fully redundant system. There's no reason with Zoom ISO that I can't have two, two ISOs pop in, you know, to, to, a, to a show and both have two entirely systems that are maybe getting the same information from one or the other, but two entirely parallel systems that are then going into encoders. Um, you know, it's not because, you know, it's just doing commands that are remote from universe. The universe could be talking to two things, two uh, Isadoras rather than one. I mean, obviously everything would have to be identical, you know, how they're going in, but there's no reason why we couldn't, um, that we couldn't build that. So it's definitely on my thought process. One of the reasons that 090 doesn't use the system right now. <laughs> so it's because it's, it is, uh, it's still got a couple little sharp edges and it doesn't have any redundancy at the moment. But, uh, but I think that we're, we're well on our way to being able to create that. Now, next question is from uh, Colin uh, Mulcahy in, in Dublin, Ireland. And he said, are there any realistic good, are there any good realistic resources for sets for fixed multicam green screen backgrounds? Go ahead, Leland. Got a couple for you. Uh, am I okay to share my screen through my camera here real quick, just to give yeah. a dip, an idea of where they're at? Uh, the first one I'll recommend for good is going to be virtualstudiosets.com. And what you'll find here, let me get out of the way here for a second so you can see it, um, is a set of several different studios that also have the side products for the extra camera views. So you can come in and download all the angles that you would need. The other, which I would probably recommend higher, is Zero Density, which is a reality editor built on the Unreal 4 engine, where you can come in here and literally create the ultimate backgrounds for your virtual studios. So good luck with those. That's great. Um, next question is from Paul Shadwell in um, uh Tur Turbenthal in Sw uh, Switzerland. And Paul asks, um, do you think the Office Hours team could take on events like we did in uh, Pixelcore, like CERN, Davos, and uh, uh, British Open uh, Golf champ Championships, all which I participated in? Now that was, yeah, so we did we did events in, at, in those locations. So we th these were not all volunteer <laughs> events. I just want to make sure we're clear. Uh, these were these were uh, pretty pretty heavy duty events. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, there was a, actually a couple more because we also did Salesforce and Fast and yeah. Furious Junket, yeah. um, which was which was really cool, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, at at Pixelcore's height, we were doing uh, three to five of those a week. <laughs> So like, like when you think about that, it was like, a, it was a scale of each one, but we were just burning through them. I mean, it was, they weren't all that big, but we do one that like the size of uh, Davos, we would do that every week. Yeah. Mm. Just the British Open, why you have us practice whispering. Yeah, exactly. We were far enough away <laughs> that we didn't have to worry wondered. about that. Oh, the, yeah, the British Open. Oh, they hate that when we say British Open too. It's like the Open. So it's like the, it's the yes, American course. Open is the Open, is the, is the American Open, but the, the British Open is the Open. I had to emphasize it so everybody knew what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the because uh, we did, well, we worked on the American Open as well. So so that's that's why for me, I was like, what did we, what did, where did Paul work on the, because I was thinking we did one in Seattle with the Open Open or the it American was, Open. Yeah, it was the very first one that we did uh, with the Wi-Fi guys at yeah. uh, the 2013 yeah yeah at, absolutely uh, Moorfield yeah um that was great lots of I ate so much haggis anyway so um I just enormous I think I had haggis every every meal um it's very much like for those of you who grew up and felt around the Pennsylvania it's like scrapple but better so anyway um the uh uh yeah so my goal is to get to a point where those are small events for what we do you know, like we could do, you know, have a large group of people that are, and again, if we get it to a point where it really feels like a hard broadcast, we can get corporate support. We can, you know, the first step will be to start supporting, 
you know, travel and hotels and, you know, those kind of and gear. Well, first thing is gear, which we have, we've already seen live view, is, um, you know, uh, helped us out a little bit getting a separate second piece. Uh, Electrosonic helped us out, you know, with with uh, with wireless. Uh, we'll see more of that first and then we'll keep on trying to figure out how we make it easier for people to, to cover it um, as it gets bigger and bigger. And I think that, you know, eventually there'll be a core staff that's a that's. Um, you know, being hired to do those things with a large, still a large volunteer staff that's still learning and being part of that process. And as we start to build that capacity. So um, I think that that's kind of where we're going to end up going over time. Um, but that might be another 900 episodes. <laughs> we, we, the faster we get to a point where we have a show that feels like a show, like we got very close with IBC. There's just a lot of little, little rough edges, you know, color and some sound and some, you know, cues and so on and so forth. The faster we close that gap, the faster we can make it bigger, you know, the, and the, the faster we'll get more support. Um, but we are making leaps and bounds every single show. The, the amount of effort and the and there's so many places that we're doing things that no one's ever done before. Um, it's kind of amazing. So it's just a matter, I think at this point, all the components are there and all we have to do is start shaving off rough, you know, sharp edges. And I think that, I, I think that's easy, you know, compared to what we were, um, you know, getting to where we are is I think important. Uh, next question is from uh, Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Uh, some equipment from vendors was provided to make IBC happen. If more vendors come to see office hours as a tech demonstration opportunity, perhaps more suppliers will want to provide their tech too and have a segment uh, reviewing all the tech that was used. Go ahead, Josh. Um, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um, I will say, though, that we've had events in the past like where um, – We've gone over the flow eight from an insider that really knew the product as well. And we reviewed that product, but without any, you know, any contractual obligations or, you know, uh, conflict of interest to be able to do it. So it's a possibility we could do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, I, uh, I think that we will be careful of not quote unquote reviewing things that we used you know, from, from that, but talking about them, like, Hey, we used the electrosonic and, you know, we use, this is how we use live view. This is how we use the black magic camera. This is how we used all those things. And to Peter's point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, um, we've done in the past where like with some of the pixel core stuff, when we were doing it as the, as part of the training, not as a hired company, um, we had, I mean, all of our gear was supplied <laughs> by somebody, <laughs> like everybody. And we said, it, you know, like, oh, we got this, we got this from, you know, uh, Sony and we got this from um, this kind of live view. Live view gave us backpacks all the time, you know, to do that kind of thing, because it's a great way to show off what they can do. So we, we, we got a lot of stuff there. And it's just a matter of tightening, you know, again, we've already done it. I mean, I think that, I think uh, live view will be excited about what we did there as, as will Electrosonic. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, there's a danger and there's uh, that comes with sponsoring a live event, uh, providing equipment that's used to transmit that live event or, or generate that live event is if if something goes wrong and it may not be the fault of whatever equipment uh, you're representing there as or who's contributed, uh, you may be tagged with, you know, being problematic or it may not reflect nicely upon your equipment. So there's that danger with a live event because things can always go wrong. And uh, that taste, that bitter taste is uh, hard to remove. Well, and it's, to your point, it's why I've been very uh, careful. I've gone back to companies who have have a long history with me. <laughs> Electrosonic and, and Live, you have been lending me things for over a decade. And those are so, two very solid technologies that deal with live events. And, so and, it, and, and understand that things yeah. <laughs> things will work or not work and everything else. They're just there. And, and again, I've had kind of a longer history with both of them. And so they have a, if the worst part is, is that if someone only has one sample of your work, if you say, oh, can you borrow, can I borrow something that doesn't work? They're never coming back. If they've done it 10 or 15 times with you and it doesn't work, oh, we'll, we'll do it again. You can't do it very, you know, you just, it's, it's this failure rate is the important part not you know um and uh, and we didn't fail it was great and that helps really build that up you know um of what we can do and and how it affects uh um you know again we can find other people that will, are willing to support what we're doing so um so anyway so i think that we'll definitely get a lot more support as we keep on moving forward um next question is from hashid uh trevetti in detona beach florida and hashid asks uh, after hours seems so magical with all the various countries and people from various parts. I got to speak 
with a community member who um, shared how they have a huge upcoming event in December in India. It sounded uh, grueling, uh, though I've uh, I've heard now. I, I think we lost. You ran out of work. You ran out of characters. What what was the finish of that, Hashid? So it was a, basically a Beju was on, and he has a huge event, and it's a 30-day event, and mm-hmm. they have to do something every single day for 30 days. Yeah. And it's just a You know, I would never do anything, shout out. everything. I would never do something every day. Like, I think that's a horrible idea. Not for us. I'm Wait. just saying he, that's an event. It's, it, it was an event that he had to do for, but just, I, I've heard stories about you in India. So just uh, what were your, you know, uh, triumphs and, you know, tragedies of being in India? I, I mean, I, so I have to admit, uh, I love, I love working in India. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's a, uh, it's kind of a magical place to do production, you know, the, I think. And, um, and I, I really enjoy it. I love the the time down. Now I, I will admit that I enjoyed, uh, Dharmashala a lot more than than Delhi, mostly because when I go to India, oftentimes it's in the winter and it's December when they're burning. And when they do that, they the um, air quality is is intense. You know, like you know, it's like the the index just put people in. It's been up to seven hundred. Like we in the United States, we consider like eighty bad. <laughs> you know, like and it's and I've I had days where it was like you couldn't you shouldn't go outside. You know, kind of thing. So I think Delhi was a little bit harder to deal with. But wow, the spice um, old Delhi is just magical. Like it's just this it's this cata- You know, you're you're going through all these um, these little uh, pathways, and there's people just keep on adding cable. You know, they keep on adding telecommunications, and so it's like these trees of of uh, you know it's like a forest of of um, of cables that are all just kind of finding their way. And I'm like, how does anyone know where any of this is going? Anyway, but and some of the best restaurants are in Old Delhi, and the spice. You know, we we kind of went we went into a. Um, the spice district and it's just this incredible, you know, incredible experience. Um, and so I, I really enjoy the experience of being in India. Um, and, uh, uh, the hard part is of course, connectivity, you know, it's hard to get electric. There's a lot of stuff that the tariffs are so high that it's hard to buy them locally. Um, there's the skill sets are, are, um, shallow, you know, so you have some people there that you're working with that are incredibly, de- you know, incredibly knowledgeable about what they do. Um, and then there's a lot of people around them that aren't as, you know, knowledgeable and, and uh, you have a hard time because there's a lot of Bobby and you have a hard time understanding like what can be done and what can't be done are things that you have to kind of like, cause everyone's doing this all the time. And you're like, well, does, what is that? Like, like, it's like, it's kind of like I hear you and, 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 but it's not like a, and, um, and so, uh, so those are some of the challenges there. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things can go wrong, power and, you know, all kinds of other things. And that's in the emerging world, that's a lot. And India is not really emerging world at this point, but in, in areas where there's just an incredible amount of population that has, you know, that there's not as much money per person, you end up with a lot of challenges that you would get. What I am amazed by is how, um, and this happens in a lot of places, but India specifically, holy smokes, can you get a lot of people, craftsmen, um, craftsmen and women that can come together and put something very complicated together very, very fast. <laughs> I, when we did a, we did a job with, um, with a head of state and when I got, uh, what I showed them what I needed and it's very clean and very basic and everything else. And they show, and they gave me a list of all the people and it was like 90 people for the sh- for a show in the United States that we would do with 12 you know, or maybe, maybe 18 people. And I was like, what are all these people? Oh, I got to build the set. And I was like, okay. Cause in the United States, you're used to just sets showing up kind of done. They came with like blank wood. Like, like they, they just showed up with like wood that looked like it had been torn out of a, what I would, what I thought would kind of felt like it came out of a, um, a dump, you know, like it was just, it had been used a thousand times. It had lots of holes in it. It was all beat up. There are parts of things or whatever. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> like this is going to turn out. They're like, no, they work with all the addict and they, they work with all the fashion folks in Mumbai. Don't worry about it. And I was like, okay, they did a better job than we ever had in the United States. In fact, I, it was the high water mark for stretched fabric that I've ever seen. And I gave them such a hard time about one seam that went through the middle because it was, you know, it needed to be higher than we, they had rolls for. I gave them a really hard time and I feel so bad about it because I hadn't done stretched fabric before. And now every time I look at stretched fabric on a set, it's worse than what we had in India. You know, like it was, it was, it's way worse. And I'm just like, Ugh, okay, you know. And so, uh, so it, it was in the crafts, the, the the craft work. It 
is unbelievable, you know. And then again, of course, the food, <laughs> so good. <laughs> so anyway, so I, uh, I um, my my still one of my most uh, intense memories was eating um, a dosa, but it was like not like one of the big ones, but like a soft one that was made in Mumbai. And well, I was getting ready to leave for the airport, and I usually don't eat street food until uh, I'm leaving, <laughs> you know, like you know, because I I have to, I just need to be operational, and um, but I'm willing to take chances on the last <laughs> on the last day out. It, 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 it hasn't been bad. I just it's, I'm just managing risk. Anyway, um, I had a uh, dosa, and it was raining, and I had chai with the dosa under a tent while it's just like monsoon. It was in literally monsoon season. And uh, I was like, this is life. <laughs> like there was a couple, there's been a couple moments when I'm doing something else. It's like, I was eating up the, you know, at, at this, and it was just, it was so good. Um, and, uh, but I, India is definitely one of my favorite. I, I, I talked to um, Marcia Kerrigan, who, you know, she's the one that did the editing and she's like, oh yeah, I, I guess she spent a couple of years. <laughs> was, are there a couple months or a couple of years in, in Southeast Asia just wandering around, you know, like in the 90s? And we were talking about Angkor Wat. She's like, yeah, I slept on the steps because there's no, no one there. There was no, it wasn't a tourist area, you know, like it was just, you know, it was just a place to be, but she spent a lot of time in India. And it's just, a, it's a truly magical place. You know, it's, it's, uh, I think you have to, you do have to get, you have to understand that there's just a lot of hardship and you have to get through that filter because if you can't get over that, it's very overwhelming when you first get there. That's just a, but it's really hard to listen to people have first world problems when you get back. <laughs> like you just, uh, you know, you watch people, I, I watch people come out literally of a cardboard box in a dress shirt, perfectly, perfectly straight, dress shirt and, and, and slacks, you know, and dress shoes, perfectly straight coming out, the, coming out of the street. And it's just the level of personal pride of how they are going to be, you know, regardless of their current circumstances, I was just constantly amazed. You know, One third and, uh, of the country is underwater right now. It's Pakistan. I've never been to Pakistan, um, but but India is not. I don't think one third of India is under underwater. There's too many mountains for that, I think. But I think it's Pakistan that's one third of water, which is an incredible problem. I mean, I'm not. Un, un, that's a whole new thing, but but I think that in India is not doesn't have that situation at the moment. Anyway, there you go. I always told you I talk about India, but but it's a. Uh, um, it's a, it's quite, it's, it's definitely one of my favorite, India, Cambodia, Japan, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, those are all, Bahia, uh, Brazil, in Brazil, some of my favorite, some of my favorite places, um, to be, um, anyway, um, last, uh, last question is from Paul Valhus. What is your forecast for the South by South, uh, coverage? Go ahead, Sky. Well, I, I'm just calculating the digital circus of OH, and if we can get uh, Noah Sargent and 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 one uh, F Jeff together on March twenty, uh, what is it? March ten through nineteen. So there's the dates. See what we what what could we do? Yeah, it's it's uh yeah we'll see. Uh, it's going to be up to the team. You know, I the. Uh, um, I am, you know, I think that that is a time that I'm probably going to be spending a lot. There's, there's some collisions for me. So, um, but it'll be up to a team that who wants to build what. So um, we'll leave it up to, um, uh, you know, I don't think it's something that I can probably take on a lot of uh, responsibility, which I haven't had to in the, up until now. Well, anyway, that's what I'm thinking. So. If we, if we start in Vegas, launching a rocket and then we go. Well, you, did you, did you. Well, I'm thinking. Good? Well, I know John's got got plans, and so I'm just thinking if, if we do a, a series of things together, maybe that would be a an idea. Get the yeah. get the band together and go on the road for a tour. Yeah, there's there is uh, um, there's also an accessibility conference that I'm interested in. You know, it's something that we haven't done in the past as well, and and mostly I think that my thing with uh, um, with <laughs> South by Southwest is is I've made a bunch of suggestions of how we could contribute to South by Southwest and there hasn't been a lot of responsiveness. So I'm there, it's kind of lower on the totem pole for me at this point because, um, you know, I was like, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And then there was, there's been kind of like, mm, no, we're not gonna do that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so like, you know, so, so that, that usually for me, like as soon as I get a couple, like I get excited and, and, uh, and then I make a bunch of suggestions and if people shoot them down too often, I just stop paying attention. So I think that's, that's probably for me, Southwest, Southwest, if they were more responsive, we'd probably spend a lot more energy on them, but 
Um, yeah, it hasn't happened. So anyway, um, uh, I promised some cakes generated by AI. So, um, so here's the, here's, here's what AI came. I, I just ran it a couple of times while we were talking. I let, I let mid journey, uh, do its thing and just kept on saying, Oh, give me a couple more of these. And I'll show you a couple of the four ups that are the different examples as well as it doesn't understand 900 candles. I'm pretty sure. Like it doesn't give us 900 candles, but it did give us, it did do some stuff that I thought was really interesting. So, um, let me, uh, let's see here. So here is uh, one of them. So the thing I, this is what I love about AI is it does things that I didn't, I didn't think of, which is that it made them all, like I was thinking of 900 all at the same height. And these are all different ones of different heights that are, that are there. And I thought that was kind of a, um, a fascinating, you know, take on it. Um, it's not enough of them, but it is more. Um, here's, here's like, so what happens is it, is it says, I want more of those. I said, I want more of that image and I get more of these. So there's, some more examples of, you know, what it came up with. Um, again, even more examples, but I, I kind of like the idea of little nubs and I, I felt this, this was much more artistic than I expected, um, you know, in, in how it looked. Um, and then uh, I'll show you one more. There's another close up, And I just find it fascinating. Like I was like, if someone, this is what I think is interesting. If someone brought me a cake that looked like that, I would be like, holy smokes, <laughs> like, 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 you know, and so as a, uh, as a cake designer, uh, you know, if, if I was a cake designer, I would definitely be paying attention to, um, I'd definitely be throwing things in as ideas because there was a bunch of creative things that it did that I didn't think of. But if I got a cake that looked like that, I'd be truly amazed, you know, and it's all doable. Like once you see it, it's all, and there was nothing about building a cake that looks like that, that would be, you know, that would be hard. The candles um, are different heights based on you lighting each one separately and trying to go through 900 candles. The, the first one would be burned down to that point by the time you got to the last one. So. Well, not if you aimed a bunch of laser beams at them and just lit them all at the same time. So you just, just you, you, trim you know, them from the bottom. You know, laser beams, that's all, you know, like, pew, pew, but you got to write that into the description, you know, but even 900 even camels lit by, lit by a laser lasers. Beam <laughs> at, at point. It's like, we'll keep on working on this. I'd literally think I go into these zones where someone said something and, um, and I will throw it into mid journey. I could do a whole little picture book on mid journey on one of one of each one of these. And I might just do a whole book where we just talk about it or whatever, because like I, uh, I did zoomification <laughs> and it a little scary like I, I don't think that it's it's i don't think it's going to uh here i'll show you a four up of, of one of the zoom if you want a pl pl place to put them i licensed it i've got oh, there the you zoomification go. url there go. yeah so like zoomification was like these these kind of <laughs> they kept nice. on going kind of alien i was like i don't know if that's going to be good for marketing um some more of the cakes here's another cake but I, I gotta tell you, man, a cake like that would be like, these look like these aren't really, we've moved away it cause it doesn't really know what it's doing. It's just kind of doing it. And so it, um, but it's, it's kind of a, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to probably get a chocolate that. of some kind. Little I know it's chocolate with gummy some drops or fungal gummy drops drops or, or something. something that would be really, really gummy fungals. Know. It got me thinking about like, now I want to make a cake, which is not necessarily in my diet. So, um, anyway, but, uh, it's pretty cool. So thanks for the suggestion. We should we should do if we think about something at the beginning of of shows. This could be the new like somewhere someone goes okay. Let's let's have the AI do a picture of this thing, and then during the during the day or during the week, someone or during the show, people are like iterating it, and then at the end, we'll show what it came up with. <laughs> could be a fun little segment and there. behind the closing credits. That's for yeah. The oh, yeah. We just put we could just put pictures up like down the side of, of the of different comments from the from the show that would be great and everybody in the production crew now is cringing like oh my gosh doing that in real time would not be fun anyway oh there we go 900 we only ran a half an hour over um and uh really really great conversation a uh, great job by the by our um producers uh keeping that conversation going giving us some some uh some guidance on where we should go so thanks for that thanks to the panelists of course we can't do this without you and we also can't do it without it's a credible production crew on a Sunday, uh, putting this stuff together, many of whom were working hard on it yesterday. <laughs> so uh, so thanks for coming back up after a, a hard one and uh, 
and still uh, jumping in and making it happen. So thanks so much. And uh, we really appreciate the contribution. It's, I was just talking to some folks that are some, uh, some, some creators about how amazing, you know, the community is. People think about, oh, I have followers and I'll have subscribers. And I'm like, oh, that's the little life. <laughs> you know, like like the, the real life is having a whole bunch of friends and cohorts to, to actually trade notes with. And it's just an amazing experience. So thank you all for the contribution that everyone makes uh, on this show. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump into After Hours. Trying to resist not making a cake. I want to make a cake that looks like my AI. I don't put it into the AI and have it design another cake. That's what we should do. Is have do an AI dance. I wonder what it, if I added hamburger to the cake. What happened? There's a new product possible out there: micro candle spores. Micro candle spores. <laughs> How do we spores? Really cool. They, they grow on 